This will be the neurology section of Pants Prep Pearls um, with a lot of added visual imaging as well, especially since the neurologic system is very visual as well. So we'll start off with traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury is a sequelae from an external um, force injuring the brain, such as head trauma. It can result in cognitive, physical, social, emotional, and behavioral symptoms. Etiologies are falls, especially in the elderly, which is most common, and MVAs. The classification of severity is important with the Glasgow Coma Scale, and this is scored between 3 and 15, 3 being the worst and 15 being the best. It is comprised of three parameters, the best eye response, E, the best verbal response, V, and the best motor response, M. The components of the GCS should be recorded individually, for example, E4, V2, M2, results in a GCS score of 8. So mild will be a score of 13 or higher, moderate is a score of 9 to 12, and severe is a score of 8 to less, 8 or less. So to go through it is E, V, M, E for eye opening, you can have a possible score of 4, so spontaneous will be 4, response to verbal commands will be 3, response to pain will be 2, and no eye opening is 1. For verbal, best verbal response is 5, and this will be oriented. If they're confused, that's 4. Inappropriate words, that's 3. Incomprehensible sounds, that's 2. And no verbal response, that's 1. For M, motor, best motor response is obeys commands with 6. Localizing response to pain for 5. Withdrawal response to pain for 4. Flexion to pain with 3. Extension to pain with 2. And no motor response is 1. Pathophysiology of a TBI. It could be primary with intra or extra parenchymal hemorrhages and diffuse axonal injury, or secondary. A multitude of molecular damage can be worsened by fever, seizures, hypoxia, and hypotension. Cushing's triad is important to know. It's hypertension, bradycardia, and an irregular respiration. So this is basically the opposite of shock symptoms. In shock symptoms, you'd have hypotension and tachycardia, but here you have hypertension and bradycardia and remember, and regular, irregular respirations. The management of a severe TBI managed in a neurosurgical ICU with frequent clinical and neurological assessments. You need to prevent hypoxia, a PaO2 of under 60, and hypotension, a systolic under 100, and ET um, intubation. Surgical evaluation for hematomas based on hematoma size, mass effect, and neurological status. Reduction of intracranial pressure, head of bed, hyperventilation, and mannitol. Hyperventilation should be avoided in the first 24 to 48 hours and should not exceed a PaCO2 of under 30 millimeters of mercury, except as a temporizing measure in a patient with impending cerebral herniation. PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, up to 15 to 20 centimeters of um, H2O, may be utilized to manage acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, following a TBI with ICP monitoring. For patients with severe TBI in an abnormal CT scan, revealing evidence of a mass effect from lesions, such as contusions, hematomas, or swelling, ventriculostomy and ICP monitoring, along with treatment for elevated intracranial pressure to target pressures below 22 millimeters of mercury is recommended. Short-term or one week of anti-seizure drugs for the prevention of early seizures, like levetiracetam or phosphenitoin could be used. Also, fever and hyperglycemia should be avoided as they may exacerbate a secondary injury. Moving to concussion syndrome. Concussion syndrome is a mild traumatic brain injury leading to an alteration in mental status with or without consciousness. It may result after blunt force or an acceleration-deceleration head injury. Manifestations are headache, dizziness, psychological symptoms, and cognitive impairment. For confusion, importantly, they'll be confused or have a blank expression, a blunted affect. For amnesia, they may have a pre-traumatic or retrograde or a post-traumatic antegrade amnesia. The duration of retrograde amnesia is usually brief, however. Headache, dizziness, visual disturbances, blurred or double vision. They may have delayed responses or emotional changes, emotional instability. Signs of increased intracranial pressure, you may see persistent vomiting, worsening headache, 
an increased disorientation and changing level of consciousness. So that's important. Increased intracranial pressure, vomiting, headache, disorientation, LOC. CT of the head without contrast, importantly, is the study of choice um, initially for evaluating most acute head injuries. MRI is the study of choice if prolonged symptoms over one to two weeks or with worsening symptoms not explained by concussion syndrome. <laughs> CT angiography of the head or neck if vascular injury is suspected. For management of concussion, cognitive and physical rest is the main management in patients with concussion. Some form of observation is recommended for a minimum of one day, outpatient or inpatient, and patients may resume strenuous activity after resolution of symptoms and recovery of memory as well as cognitive functions. Neurosurgical or neurologic consult if the CT shows a mass effect, substantial hematomas like epidural, subdural, or cerebral, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, depressed skull fracture, or cerebral edema. So here it brings up um, the pants prep pearl of the week, which is low motor neuron versus upper motor neuron. So in lower motor neuron lesions, you'll have the muscles that are flabby fasciculations, flaccid paralysis, loss of muscle tone and strength, A reflexia, like decreased deep tendon reflexes, Babinski downwards, and they'll be young, like infantile poliomyelitis, um, also known as infantile paralysis. And some of the conditions of this lower motor neuron lesions are Guillain-Barre, botulism, poliomyelitis, cauda equina syndrome, and Bell's palsy. For upper motor neuron lesions, the muscles are spastic, slightly muscle, slight muscle loss and no atrophy, a positive Bobensky, and posturing with the toes pointed up, absence of fasciculations, strong tone, such as spastic paralysis, tone increased, spastic paralysis again, increased deep tendon reflexes, and clonus. Some of these conditions are stroke, like a CVA, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, spinal cord, or brain damage, like a TBI. So they're spastic because they don't have the CNS ability to inhibit the um, reflex arc that is the lower motor neuron. So now we'll move to cranial nerves, and we'll go over some of the reflexes. So for eyelid, cranial nerve 3 opens the eyelids. Damage causes ptosis. For cranial nerve 7, it closes the eyelids. For the pupillary reflex, cranial nerve 2 is the afferent aspect, which is sensory, so it takes in the light. Cranial nerve 3 is the efferent, the motor aspect of the pupillary reflex, and this constricts um, consensually as well. So that's cranial nerve 3 for the efferent. For the corneal reflex, reflex this is cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, for the affer afferent component, which is sensory. And cranial nerve 7 for the efferent component, the facial nerve for the corneal reflex motor component. So going through cranial nerves 1 through 12, 1 is olfactory, this does smell, 2 is optic, which does vis visual acuity, visual fields, and pupillary light reflex, such as during the swinging light test. And some of the abnormalities with cranial nerve 2 might be a Marcus Gunn pupil or optic neuritis. Cranial nerve 3 is oculomotor, inferior rectus and ciliary body are physical examinations, and this will be, lead to ocular motor dysfunction or a dilated pupil. The trochlear nerve is cranial nerve 4. This is motor and its superior oblique rectus muscle. Cranial nerve 5 is trigeminal, which does motor and sensory. For motor, th these are the muscles of mastication, closing the jaw, moving chin side to side. And for sensory of the trigeminal nerve, will be light touch, especially with a cotton wisp to test the three divisions of the nerve, the ophthalmic branch, the maxillary branch, and the mandibular branches. And some of the abnormalities could be trigeminal neuralgia. For abducens, which is the sixth cranial nerve, this is motor. This does lateral rectus, lateral gaze. And uh, three, four, and six help with extraocular movements overall. Cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve, does both sensory and motor. For motor of the facial nerve, these are the muscles of facial expression, including blinking of the eyelid, raising the eyebrow, frowning, closing eyes tightly, as well as puffing the cheeks out. And for sensory of the facial nerve, it's taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. 
and some somatic fibers to the external ear as well. So it can move the external ear. Um, abnormalities of the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, will be Bell's palsy as well, Ram as, well as Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which is herpes zoster oticus. For the 8th cranial nerve, this is acoustic or the vestibular cochlear nerve. For hearing, it does speech, and you can test this with the Weber and Renee test. And vestibular function, balance, and proprioception. Some abnormalities might be an acoustic neuroma. For cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal, motor will be swallowing in the gag reflex, and for sensory taste in the posterior one-third of the tongue. The vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, for motor does voice, soft palate, and gag reflex, and for sensory, relays to the brain sensory information about the organs, like the pulmonary, heart, and GI tract. For the accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11, this does um, motor, shrugs the shoulders, and turns head from side to side. So does the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. The hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12, does motor, and this innervates the tongue. Inspect for fasciculations and asymmetry of the tongue. And going over some of the different nerve roots, first we'll start off with C5, which for its motor component does shoulder abduction and elbow flexion, palms up. The muscles C5 innervates are the deltoid and the biceps. Its sensory component is the lateral arm below the deltoid and above the elbow, as well as the axillary nerve. And the reflexes, if you have damage to C5, will be a loss of bicep jerk reflex. For C6, this does elbow flexion, thumbs up, and wrist extension. The muscles of C6 are the brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis. For sensory of C6, thumb and radial side of the hand. And the reflexes are brachioradialis for C6. For C7, elbow extension and wrist flexion. The muscles of C7 are triceps and flexor carpi radialis. Sensory is the radial side of the fingers, as well as fingers 2, 3, and 4. And if you have damage to C7, you will have loss of triceps jerk reflex. For C8, this will be finger flexion, the flexor digitorum superficialis, median nerve for sensory of C8, and plus or minus Horner syndrome, which is ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. For T1, this will be finger abduction and adduction. The interossei muscles are innervated by T1, and the medial elbow and ulnar nerve are T1. And so don't forget also for the peroneal nerve. This innervates the peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, and the short head of the biceps femoris muscle. Injuries lead to a foot drop. Now we'll move to headaches. For headaches, the primary are 90%, which are migraine, tension, cluster, and rebound headaches. Primary are idiopathic in nature, and tension and migraine are most common in women. Secondary are 4% of headaches, with meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracranial hypertension, hypertensive crisis, and acute glaucoma. For tension type headaches, these are the most common overall cause of primary headache. The mean onset of age is around 30. Risk factors are mental stress, sleep deprivation, and eye strain. Clinical manifestations of tension headaches are bilateral, pressing, tightening band-like, non-throbbing, non-pulsatile, steady or aching headache, often worse throughout the day, worsens with stress, fatigue, noise, and glare, not worsened with routine activity, such as migraines, usually not pulsatile and not associated with nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, or focal neurologic symptoms, such as auras. On physical exam of a tension headache, usually normal but may have pericranial muscle tenderness, tenderness to the head, neck, or shoulders, or around the occiput. Diagnosis is clinical. It's a diagnosis of exclusion as well, as there are no specific tests. And for management, first line is NSAIDs or other analgesics, like acetaminophen or aspirin, and local heat. For trigeminal neuralgia, or tic douloureux, this is the, path the pathophysiology of trigeminal neuralgia is um, compression of the trigeminal nerve cranial nerve 5, root by the superior cerebral artery or vein, which is 90%. So compression by the um, superior cerebral artery or vein. Most common in middle-aged women and in younger patients suspect MS, 
Clinical manifestations of trigeminal neuralgia are headache, which is paroxysmal, brief, episodic, stabbing, lancinating, or shock-like pain in the second or third division of the trigeminal nerve, so that be the maxillary or the manibular, lasting seconds to minutes. There must, it's much worse with touch, chewing, brushing teeth, drafts of wind, and movement, and it's often unilateral. The pain starts near the mouth and shoots to the eye, ear, and nostril on the ipsilateral side and often occurs many times throughout the day. For physical examination, usually normal, but they may have trigger zones that may trigger an attack on light palpation. Usually a clinical diagnosis in the absence of history and physical findings suggestive of a serious underlying condition. And you want to rule out others. Get an ESR, CRP for temporal arteritis, and you could even get an MRI if you're considering MS. Management, carbamazepine is first line, as well as oxcarbamazepine. Gabapentin, baclofen, and lamotrigine also. And if refractory, surgical decompression with the gamma knife surgery may be needed. So next, continuing with headaches, migraine headache. This is more common in women, and a family history um, is positive 80% of the time. Two major types of migraines are migraines without aura, which is most common, and there's also rarer migraines with aura, which is classic. Clinical manifestations of migraines, usually lateralized, pulsatile, throbbing, headache, often associated with nausea, vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, usually 4 to 72 hours in duration, and moderate to severe in intensity. Worsened with routine physical activity, stress, lack of sleep, or excess sleep, alcohol, or specific foods like chocolate, red wine, as well as hormonal, contraception, and menstruation, as well as dehydration. They may have auras, which are focal neurologic symptoms that usually last under 60 minutes, 5 to 20 minutes are common. Auras accompany or follow the headache within 60 minutes. Visual auras are the most common type. There could also be auditory, somatosensory, or loss of function like aphasia or hearing. Physical exam for migraines, usually normal. They may have aphasia, dysarthria, paresthesias, or weakness. The diagnosis is clinical. And for symptomatic or abortive management, you want to use NSAIDs, acetaminophen, or aspirin first line if it's mild. Some migraine medications have caffeine added to improve symptoms. IV fluids and placing the patient in a dark and quiet room are also helpful. Triptans or orgotamines if moderate to severe, if no response to analgesics. Ergotamines have more adverse effects compared to tryptans as they cause vasoconstriction systemically. Antiemetics like metoclopramide and prochlorperazine may be used, especially if nausea and vomiting too. And for prophylactic preventative medications, you want to use antihypertensives like beta blockers such as propanolol, non-selective beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. TCAs, anticonvulsants as well, like valproate or topiramate, and NSAIDs. So going into some of the migraine medications more specifically, these will be the triptans. Sumatriptan is the most commonly used, as well, and it can come in an oral, subcutaneous, or nasal spray, as well as zolmitriptan. Um, some other oral agents are risatriptan and elliptriptan. The mechanism is a serotonin, 5-HT1B-D, agonists causing vasoconstriction and also blocking pain pathways in the brainstem. So they constrict and decrease nociception. Indications for tryptans are moderate to severe migraines or no response to analgesics in mild disease. They can be combined with analgesics too. Adverse effects, chest tightness from vasoconstriction, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, flushing, as well as malaise. Contraindications to tryptans, ischemic stroke, or ischemic heart disease, uncontrolled hypertension, pregnancy is a contraindication, hemiplegic or basilar migraines. Triptans should not be used within the first 24 hours of the use of ergotamines as well. So you don't double up with ergotamines and triptans. Too much vasoconstriction. For ergotamines, you have ergotamine, which is oral, or dihydroergotamine, D-H-E, which comes I-M, I-V, sub-Q, and intranasal. And these are non-selective. So the mechanism of action of ergotamines are serotonin, same thing, 5-HT-1B-D agonists, 
causing vasoconstriction and decreasing nociception. Indications are reserved use due to its adverse effects and contraindications. So triptans are associated with lower occurrence of adverse effects compared to ergotamines. Ergotamines can go all over the body, so you need to watch out for things like bowel infarct, hypertension, and gangrene as well. Adverse effects are also rebound headache, and contraindications to ergotamines are coronary artery disease, may cause coronary artery vasoconstriction, hypertension again, CVA or PAD, hepatic or renal disease, or migraines even with prolonged aura, and pregnancy too. So abortive migraine therapy, um, talking about antiemetics, you can do IV metoclopramide, chlorpromazine, IV or IM, and prochlorperazine as well. Mechanism is dopamine receptor antagonists, may also reduce headaches and pain intensity. Indications, nausea and vomiting with patients with migraine. And adverse effects are your EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, as they inhibit dopamine. So similar to a first-gen antipsychotic, except these are more focused on nausea and vomiting. So again, anti, um, adverse effects are EPS with acute dystonic reactions like dyskinesias characterized by intermittent spasmodic or sustained contractions of muscle, of the face especially, neck, trunk, etc. And for this, you want to do IV diphenhydramate, Benadryl, can be given to prevent or treat dystonic reactions. So this is an antihistamine. And also note that an adverse effect of these abortive antiemetics are QT prolongation. So same thing with first-gen antipsychotics. You have that QT prolongation and those EPS symptoms. So why is this happening? These meds decrease dopamine, which increases the relative choline, thus need to balance it out with an anticholinergic such as Benadryl. So Benadryl is that anticholinergic and antihistamine. Um, next, prophylactic or preventative migraine therapy. Indications are frequent and long-lasting migraine headaches, especially if associated with disability or effects um, of quality of life. So lifestyle changes, good sleep hygiene, regular exercise and avoidance of triggers, antihypertensives, especially non-selective beta blockers like propanolol, calcium channel blockers like forapamil. You can use TCAs or amitriptyline or venlafaxine and SNRI. Anticonvulsants like valproate, entopyramate, and NSAIDs. And remember your beta-1 selectives are um, bisoprolol, esmolol, atanolol, metoprolol, BEAM, BEAM, your non-selectives could care less which receptors they affect, CL, carvedilol, and labetalol, and there's also propanolol. So next, moving to cluster headaches. Cluster headaches predominantly are in young and middle-aged males. They're 10 times more common than in women, in males. Associated with multiple frequent headaches with high intensity and brief duration, they occur in clusters. They're worse with, um, worse with alcohol, especially, and worse at night as well. Also, stress and ingestion of specific foods. Clinical manifestations of cluster headaches, severe unilateral, periorbital, or temporal pain, sharp lancinating. The bouts last under two hours with spontaneous remission. The bouts can occur several times a day, and they may have one or two cluster um, periods per year, each lasting weeks to months. On physical exam, you may have ipsilateral findings such as Horner syndrome, again, ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, conjunctivitis, and lacrimation. So it's easy to confuse these with a sinus headache with that nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, conjunctivitis, and lacrimation for cluster headaches. Diagnosis is clinical, and acute management is very important to do oxygen. 100% um, oxygen is first line, 6 to 10 liters. Also, anti-migraine medications may help during attacks, like sub-Q sumatriptan or ergotamines. And prophylaxis is verapamil, first line. Also, ergotamines, corticosteroids, valproate, lithium. But most things important to know is um, the ipsilateral findings, the Horner syndrome, as well as the mimicking of the sinus headaches. Um, acute management is that oxygen, and prophylaxis is verapamil. Next, going to idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or pseudotumor cerebri. This is an idiopathic increased intracranial CSF pressure with no clear cause evident on neuroimaging, like CT or MRI. It's also called pseudotumor cerebri, as it mimics a brain tumor with nausea, vomiting, and visual disturbances. 
Risk factors are obese women of childbearing age. And for meds, risk factors are corticosteroid withdrawal, growth hormone, thyroid replacement, OCPs, and long-term tetracycline use, and very important, vitamin A toxicity. So vitamin A toxicity is a risk factor for intracranial, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Also no venous sinus thrombosis too. Clinical manifestations, signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, such as headache, pulsatile, worsened with straining or changes in position, retrobulbar pain that may be worse with eye movement, nausea, vomiting, tinnitus, and especially visual changes, which may lead to blind, blindness if not treated. So they may have that um, cranial, cranial nerve 6 palsy, abducens nerve, which may lead to diplopia, as well as papilledema. So again, ocular examination, fundus fundoscopic exam will show papilledema, usually bilateral and symmetric, importantly. And they may have visual field loss, and they may have diplopia due to cranial, cranial nerve 6 palsy. For diagnosis, you want to do a CT performed prior to LP to rule out intracranial mass. So you always want to do that CT first if you're, susp if you're suspicious of a mass lesion. For LP, lumbar puncture, you'll see increased CSF pressure, 250 millimeters of um, H2O or greater, otherwise normal CSF, or over 25 centimeters of H2O. MRI with MR venography is ideal neuroimaging. Management of pseudotumor is acetazolamide first line as it decreases CSF pressure, and weight loss is also recommended. Furosemide may be adjunctive, and a short course of systemic corticosteroids may be indicated if acute visual loss as a temporizing measure prior to surgical intervention. Repeat LP reduces intracranial pressure. If refractory pseudotumor cerebri, you can do a ventriculoperitoneal shunt which is a shunt that connects the ventricles to pump and drain it into the peritoneum, as well as an optic nerve sheath fenestration, which is, uh, creates fenestrations in the optic sheath on the way to the eye, basically, that decreases the pressure. And Rosh also said that Topamax is the treatment for this, so topiramate. So to go over some classic CSF findings, multiple sclerosis will show a high IgG oligoclonal bands, GBS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, will show a high protein with normal white blood cells, which is also called albuminocytologic dissociation. Bacterial meningitis will show a high protein with an increased white blood cells, primary, primarily PMNs, and decreased glucose as the bacteria eat up the glucose. Viral aseptic meningitis will have a normal glucose and an increased white blood cells, predominantly lymphocytes, fungal or TB, Meningitis, decreased glucose, increased white blood cells, again, primarily lymphocytes. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension, increased CSF pressure, otherwise normal. And subarachnoid hemorrhage, importantly, xanthochromia, and also blood in the CSF. So this is tan skin colored CSF due to blood or bilirubin. So next, going into acute bacterial meningitis. This is a reportable disease and a bacterial infection of the meninges. 25% have a history of otitis or sinusitis, so, which is why um, strep pneumo could be a cause here. And so for etiologies, the most common is strep pneumonia, which is the most common cause in adults of all ages and in children ages over three months to 10 years. Neisseria meningitidis um, is the most common in older children, 10 years to 19 years and second most common cause in adults, and importantly is associated with that petechial rash on the trunk, legs, and conjunctiva. That's non-blanchable. Neisseria meningitis. GBS, group B streptococcus, most common cause in neonates under one month, as it's part of the vaginal flora, and also infants under three months for GBS. And importantly, listeria monocytogenes, increased incidence in neonates, over 50 years, immunocompromised states as well, such as a history of glucocorticoid use, alcoholism, pregnancy, AIDS, HIV, chemo. And so if you're suspecting listeria, you want to cover with ampicillin as well. So for neonates, group B strep 
E. coli and gram-negative rods are common causes of neonatal meningitis. And listeria, you need to know as an important pathogen. Haemophilus influenza, reduced incidence due to HIV vac vaccination. Clinical manifestations of acute bacterial meningitis. The classic meningeal symptoms, headache, neck stiffness, fever, which is the classic triad. Also photosensitivity, chills, nausea, and vomiting. They also may develop altered mental status and seizures. So they may develop increased intracranial pressure and lead to a Cushing's triad, hypertension, um, irregular respirations, and bradycardia. Also other cranial nerve palsies as well. Physical exam, meningeal signs, nuchal rigidity, importantly, a positive Brzezinski's, which is neck flexion produces knee or hip flexion, and a positive Kiernig sign, inability to extend the knee or leg with hip flexion. Also focal, neurologic, <laughs> focal neurologic findings. For diagnosis of bacterial meningitis, lumbar puncture plus CSF examination are the best initial test and definitive diagnosis. Decreased glucose under 45, increased neutrophils, PMNs, increased protein and increased pressure. So increased everything for bacterial except for a decrease in glucose. You want to get a head CT, which is the best initial test prior to LP only if you need to rule a mass effect if any of these are present. Papilledema, seizures, confusion, focal neuro findings, over 60 years old, immunocompromised, or a history of CNS disease. So I got a question and the patient had diplopia and it said which one do you want to get first and the right answer is head CT. So diplopia would be a focal neuro finding. So you want to get that head CT to rule out a mass effect before you do the LP as LP could cause herniation if you have a mass actually. So now to go over some of the findings in different types of meningitis. So for normal your opening pressure is 5 to 20. The appearance is normal. Protein is normal, glucose 50 to 80, white blood cells 0 to 5. For bacterial, you have an increased opening pressure, 200 to 500. Turbid, turbid appearance, proteins will be increased, glucose will be decreased under 45 or under 40. White blood cell count will be increased, which is called pleocytosis, and this will be over 80% neutrophils, PMNs, and that will be 100 to 100,000. Gram stain, 60 to 90 percent will be positive for bacterial. For viral or aseptic meningitis, opening pressure will be normal or mildly increased. Appearance is clear. Protein is normal or mildly increased. Glucose is normal, very importantly. White blood cell count will have a small increase, but it will be predominantly lymphocytes. And fungal will be the same thing, except also decreased glucose. But fungal will also have a lymphocytic white blood cells. So moving to the management of acute bacterial meningitis, the management is antibiotics along, along with dexamethasone when indicated, which should be started as quickly as possible after the LP is performed. If LP is contraindicated or prior to head CT, if a head CT is to be performed prior to LP, as quickly as possible after blood cultures are obtained. In adults, dexamethasone has been shown to reduce mortality and sequelae of strep pneumo, H flu, and N meningitis. It's also recommended in children if H flu type B is suspected as it reduces the incidence of cranial nerve 8 and related hearing loss. Okay, so going through what we should do for management initially. If we suspect it's a mass lesion, look at the criteria if CT or not to be performed before the LP. And then LP, start antibiotics right after or before the CT or LP is contraindicated. So we need to do the LP before we start the antibiotics in order to get the accurate count of white blood cells on the LP. So for the management treatment, empiric for over one month old to 50 years old is Vank and Ceftriaxone. Empiric for over 50 years old, remember we want to cover, cover Listeria, so we add ampicillin to Vank and Ceftriaxone. So I remember it VCA, Vank, Ceftriaxone, and Ampicillin. Empiric for neonates up to one month, Ampicillin plus Gent or Cefoxetine. And additional management for N meningitis, you want to do droplet precautions and should be continued for 24 hours after the initiation of antibiotics.
with suspected or confirmed and meningitis infection. Post-exposure prophylaxis needs to use Cipro or Rifampin. Prophylaxis is only needed for close contacts with prolonged exposure over 8 hours or direct exposure to respiratory secretions. So, post-exposure prophylaxis for Neisseria meningitis, Cipro or Rifampin for close contacts. Prophylaxis is not recommended for healthcare workers who do not have direct exposure to respiratory secretions. Okay, so next, normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is dilation of the cerebral ventricles with normal opening pressure on lumbar puncture. The pathophys is unknown but thought to be due to impaired CSF absorption after a CNS injury, like subarachnoid hemorrhage, chronic meningitis, tumors, inflammatory diseases, or head injury. The clinical manifestations are a classic triad of dementia and cognitive dysfunction, gait disturbance, and urinary incontinence. So some say wet, wobbly, and wacky. I memorize it by CUA, which is cover your butt, and it's cognition, um, urination, and ataxia, like an ataxic gait. Um, gait disturbances, you'll have the wide-based shuffling gait, described as gait apraxia or magnetic gait as if the feet are stuck to the floor. May be associated with postural instability, especially when attempting to turn, which is the most prominent feature. Dementia and cognitive dysfunction, impaired executive function and psychomotor depression. Urinary incontinence may present as urinary urgency early in the disease. And they may have other things like hyperreflexia, spasticity, lethargy, and weakness. For diagnosis of NPH, you want to Get neuroimaging and you'll see enlarged ventricles in the absence of or out of proportion to the sulcal dilation. MRI is superior to CT. For LP, CSF pressure is usually normal, however. Removing fluid during LP may cause improvement of symptoms, so the LP is therapeutic in this. And management of normal pressure hydrocephalus is a ventriculoperitoneal shunt as the treatment of choice. Gait abnormality is usually the most improved. So remember, the ventricular peritoneal shunt is the treatment of choice in NPH. However, it's a refractory treatment in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Next will be aseptic meningitis. Clinical and laboratory evidence of meningitis with negative routine bacterial cultures. The etiologies are enteroviruses as the most common cause, which are Coxsackie virus and echovirus. Other viruses like mycobacteria, fungi, spirochetes medications and malignancies are possible. HSV is possible and leads to a 70% mortality, so it's very important to know that one. And for clinical manifestations of aseptic, classic symptoms of meningitis but may be milder. Meningeal symptoms again, such as headache, which is retroorbital, neck stiffness, photosensitivity, fever, chills, nausea, and vomiting as well. No mental alteration. Physical exam of aseptic meningitis, again the meningeal signs like nuchal rigidity, positive Brzezinski's, and Kiernig sign, no focal neurodeficits in aseptic meningitis help to distinguish it from encephalitis. For diagnosis of aseptic meningitis, it's a diagnosis of exclusion after you rule out bacterial, and LP is the best initial and most accurate test if no symptoms of a mass effect. For CSF, you'll find classic findings such as a normal glucose, lymphocytic predominance, and protein count usually under 200. For management, it's just supportive, antipyretics, fluids, and analgesics, and most patients have a self-limited course. As for encephalitis, next, this is an infection of the brain parenchyma itself. Etiologies are HSV-1 as the most common cause. It could also be varicella zoster, EBV, measles, mumps, rubella, HIV, St. Louis virus, also West Nile virus. So clinical manifestations are meningeal symptoms like headache, neck stiffness, photosensitivity, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, seizures, and also the presence of altered mental status, very importantly. Changes in personality, speech, and movement. This is the presence of AMS plus personality, speech, and movement change helps distinguish encephalitis from aseptic meningitis. Physical exam of encephalitis, focal neurodeficits, hemiparesis, sensory deficits, cranial nerve palsies as well. Could have diabetes insipidus from hypothalamic pituitary axis disruption. 
or aside ADH as well. Diagnosis, CT scan of the head must be performed first to rule out space-occupying lesions, as these patients often have altered mental status requiring imaging before LP, very important. So CT scan first in encephalitis due to the altered mental status. Then LP performed after the CT. You'll see a normal glucose, increased lymphocytes again, similar to aseptic. And you can also do an MRI, which is um, the most be which is the best test. And you'll see temporal involvement, characteristic of HSV. So temporal involvement on MRI for encephalitis is characteristic of HSV. PCR testing of the CSF fluid is the most accurate test for herpes encephalitis. So management of encephalitis, IV acyclovir. And you want to do this empirically to treat, a, to treat for HSV encephalitis. And it should be initiated as soon as possible if the patient has encephalitis with no other obvious cause. Also supportive management. So you want to assume for encephalitis that it could be HSV and do empiric treatment. To go into some of the different functions and areas from the anatomy of the brain, just to recap, the thalamus is the major switchboard of the brain. This process processes nearly all the motor and sensory input before it reaches the cortex. The basal ganglia is the motor control for the initiation of actions. The hypothalamus um, does homeostasis, circadian rhythm, and autonomic control. The amygdala does memory, emotions, and fear. The hippocampus does essential for memory and learning facts in the brainstem and spinal cord as well. And to note, the homunculus is the body's representation as a body is placed on the cortex um, as it ref reflects um, the space of the body as it occupies the cerebral cortex. The medulla is where the pyramid desiccation, decussation occurs as fibers cross from one side to the other in the medulla. Basal ganglia disorders. Since the basal ganglia is involved in coordinating movement, emotion, and cognition, problems can lead to movement disorders like dyskinesias, dystonias, Parkinsonism, Huntington's disease, or behavioral control like Tourette's or obsessive compulsive disorders. Within the classification of extrapyramidal symptoms, we have dyskinesia. Dyskinesia is involuntary spasms, repetitive motions, or abnormal voluntary movement. Dystonia which is sustained contraction, muscle spasm, especially of the antagonistic muscles, such as simultaneous biceps and triceps contraction, leading to twisting of the body or abnormal posturing, like torticollis or writer's cramp. Myoclonus, which is sudden, brief, sporadic, involuntary jerking or twitching of one muscle or muscle group, but it's not suppressible. Ticks. Ticks are sudden, repetitive, non-rhythmic movements or vocals, using specific muscle groups. Ticks are suppressible, unlike myoclonus. Tourette's syndrome is, is an example of ticks. Chorea, which is rapid involuntary jerking, uncontrolled, purposeless movement. Examples of chorea are Huntington's chorea, due to the caudate nucleus atrophy of, in the basal ganglia. There's also Sydenham's chorea in uh, rheumatic fever. Muscle spasms, muscle contractions, Tonic muscle contractions, prolonged sustained contraction and rigidity. Clonic are repetitive rapid movements. Tremors are rhythmic movements of a body part. Resting tremor is Parkinson's. Postural tremor, tremors occurring while holding the body against gravity. And intentional tremor, tremors occurring during movement or when approaching nearer to the target. So Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism is disorders associated with tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and postural instability. Parkinsonism itself includes Parkinson's disease, which is loss of dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia. It could also be due to dopamine antagonists, which are medications that block dopamine, which include the typical antipsychotics like haloperidol, droperidol, flufenazine, chlorpromazine over the atypical antipsychotics, or second-gen antipsychotics, olanzapine, um, clozapine, and risperidone. Also, antiemetics are possible too, prochlorperazine, pro promethazine, and metoclopramide. Lewy body disease is also characterized um, by Parkinsonism due to loss of dopaminergic neurons, which leads to motor features similar to Parkinson's disease, loss of um, 
Cholinergic neurons leads to dementia, similar to Alzheimer's, visual spatial dysfunction, and recurrent visual hallucinations. So Lewy body disease characterized by that visual spatial dysfunction and recurrent visual hallucinations. Head trauma, HIV, carbon monoxide, mercury poisoning, etc. can also cause symptoms of Parkinsonism. Next we'll go into movement disorders itself. First will be Huntington's disease. This is an autosomal dominant neurodegenerative disorder. The pathophys is inheritance of trinucleotide repeats, CAG and glutamine, on the Huntington gene, chromosome 4 importantly. Huntington gene leads to neurotoxicity as well as cerebral, putamen, and caudate nucleus atrophy. Clinical manifestations usually start at 30 to 50 years of age. And there's three hallmark uh, manifestations of Huntington's. Mood, movements, and memory. Behavioral and mood changes, chorea, the rapid involuntary movements, and dementia. Behavioral changes will have personality, cognitive, intellectual, and psychiatric, um, including irritability. Chorea, or movement, rapid involuntary or arrhythmic movements of the face, trunk, limbs initially. Chorea worsening with voluntary movements and stress but usually disappears with sleep, and dementia. Most develop dementia before 50 years old, primarily in executive dysfunction. They may also have gait abnormalities, ataxia, often irregular and unsteady, incontinence, and facial grimacing. Physical exam will be restless, um, fragility, quick involuntary hand movements, brisk DTRs. For diagnosis of Huntington's, clinically and also family history if known, and genetic confirmation. Remember that chromosome 4 with the trinucleotide CAG glutamine repeats. Neuroimaging, cerebral and striatal, caudate nucleus and putamen atrophy, seen on CT and MRI. Also, you can get a PET scan, um, which will show decreased glucose metabolism in the caudate nucleus and putamen. Management of Huntington's, there's no care, and it's usually fatal within 15 to 20 years after presentation due to the disease progression. No medications to stop the disease progression as well. Tetrabenazine for dyskinesia or chorea, chorea can be used. This is a central monoamine depleting agent. Antidopaminergics can be used, typical or atypical antipsychotics. Also benzos may help with chorea and sleep, especially during stressful times. So don't forget tetrabenazine, chromosome 4, as well as the three M's, mood, movement, and memory changes between 30 and 50 years old. And also the cerebral and striatal um, on neuroimaging atrophy. Next will be essential familial tremor, benign. Again, an autosomal dominant inherited disorder of unknown etiology. Incidence increases with age. Manifestations are an intentional tremor, postural bilateral action tremor, most commonly affecting the upper extremities and head. <laughs> hands, forearms, head, neck, or voice, tremor worsening with intentional movement and adrenergic activity, such as emotional stress and anxiety, tremor improved with alcohol ingestion, slight improvement with rest. Physical exam, on the finger-to-nose test, the tremor increases at the end of approaching the target or holding a pos uh, position against gravity, so when more fine accuracy is needed. Besides the tremor, there are no other significant neurologic findings. The cogwheel phenomenon may be seen in some. For diagnosis of a central familial tremor, it's a diagnosis of exclusion based on family history, importantly, as well as a physical after ruling out other causes. Management, um, treatment's not usually needed, but they can do propanolol if severe or situational. Primidone, importantly, which is a barbiturate if no relief with propanolol, instead of propanolol or with it as well. Alprazolam, a benzo, is third line and thalamotomy in refractory cases. So propranolol, primidone, and alprazolam. So essential tremor versus Parkinson's. Essential tremor, tremor affects the head and voice, intentional and postural, worse with movement and stress, relieved with alcohol and propanolol and primidone, and it's usually bilateral and symmetrical. On the other hand, Parkinson's is a resting tremor, worse at rest and stress, relieved with voluntary activity, intentional movement, and sleep, and it usually starts on one side of the body, importantly, for Parkinson's.
Now we'll move more specifically into Parkinson's disease and its management. Parkinson's is a movement disorder due to idiopathic loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. The pathophys is a loss of dopaminergic neurons leads to a failure of acetylcholine inhibition in the basal ganglia. Acetylcholine is an excitatory CNS neurotransmitter, whereas dopamine is inhibitory. Also affects dopamine's ability to initiate movement. The onset of symptoms is usually 45 to 65, most common. The clinical manifestations are a classic triad of a resting tremor, bradykinesia, and muscle rigidity. They'll have normal DTRs and a relatively immobile face. Dementia is a late finding. Resting tremor, often the first symptom. This will be a classic pill rolling tremor of the hand. It's worse at rest and with emotional stress. It improves with voluntary activity, intentional movement, and sleep. It's usually combined to one limb or one side for years before it becomes generalized. Bradykinesia is slowness of voluntary movement and decreased autonomic movements, like a lack of swinging of the arms while walking in a shuffling gait. So remember the festination of the gait. Rigidity, increased resistance to passive movement, to cog wheel rigidity or a flexed posture. And again, festination, increased speed while walking. Normal DTRs, no muscle weakness. Don't forget the face involvement, the immobile face, fixed facial expressions, the widening of the palpebral fissure, and importantly, Meyerson's sign, tapping on the bridge of the nose repeatedly, repeatedly causes a sustained blink. This is also called the glabellar reflex. Seborrhea of the skin is also common. Postural instability is usually a late finding. The pull test, standing behind the patient and pulling the shoulders, causes the patient to fall or take a step backwards. Dementia in 50% is a late finding and may develop depression as well. Diagnosis, clinical, clinically, and post-mortem histology, they, may, they will see cytoplasmic inclusions, Lewy bodies, and loss of pigment cells seen in the substantia nigra. So for management, there's a variety of different things. However, levodopa, carbidopa is the most effective treatment. Other dopamine agonists like bromocryptine, premipexol, ropinirole may be used as initial management. Anticholinergics like trihexyphenidyl and benztropine. Amantadine can be used, which increases dopamine. MAOB inhibitors like selegiline or salgiline. COMT inhibitors like intancapone and tolcapone. And um, deep brain stimulation is extremely effective for rigidity and tremors in select patients. So now we'll go into all of the different medications used in this Parkinson's disease. So first, of course, levodopa. Mechanism is levodopa is converted into dopamine once it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So carbidopa reduces the amount of levodopa needed and also reduces the peripheral conversion of levodopa into dopamine, therefore reducing the adverse effects of levodopa. Indications are the most effective treatment for symptoms of Parkinson's, and the adverse effects are nausea and vomiting, orthostatic hypotension, solemnance and headache, psychosis and hallucinations upon initiation of therapy. So just think about this is the mechanism of, by which antipsychotics work. So they do the opposite. So this is increasing dopamine, whereas antipsychotics inhibit dopamine. So therefore, you would see that a decrease in psychotic effects. But here, psychosis and hallucinations are common. Dyskinesia, involuntary movements, especially the lower extremities, and akinesia, and importantly, long-term is associated with the wearing off effect, decreasing its efficacy. Levodopa should be used at the same minimum dose of clinical e efficacy to reduce the wearing off effect. If levodopa is stopped abruptly, a syndrome similar to neuroleptic malignant syndrome can occur. So a sudden decrease in dopamine as if just added, like a first-gen antipsychotic. So next will be dopamine agonists. That's bromocryptine, pramipexol, and ropinirol, BPR. The mechanism is directly stimulates dopamine receptors. These have less motor adverse effects than levodopa, but not as effective as levodopa. So basically a weaker dopamine. Indications can be used as a first line in younger patients, like under 65, to delay the use of levodopa because we want to save it due to that wearing off effect. If the patient is not sensitive to levodopa, they will often be insensitive to dopamine agonists as well. And adverse effects are similar to levodopa, 
Again, that orthostatic hypotension, headache, dizziness, hallucinations, confusion, anorexia, and more frequent non-motor side effects compared to levodopa, like sleep disturbances, solemnance, dizziness, impulse control. So this is such as compulsive shopping or gambling, or hypersexuality from dopamine reward effect, which is not really found in levodopa. Anticholinergics, trihexaphenidyl and benztropine. The mechanism is anticholinergic, so anti-muscarinic, and it blocks the excitatory effects of acetylcholine. Indicated for monotherapy in younger patients under 70 with tremor as the predominant symptom, without the significant bradykinesia or gait disturbance. So they're already having a lack of dopamine, and they're having too much acetylcholine to dopamine ratio. So we want to decrease the acetylcholine as well, so it's on a similar ratio, and that helps decrease the tremor. So the anticholinergics, that's basically to decrease the tremor. It does not improve bradykinesia. Adjunctive treatment for severe uh, tremor, despite levodopa or dopamine agonists. And the adverse effects of the anticholinergics, again, trihexyphenidyl and benztropine, are anticholinergic, like constipation, dry mouth, blurred vision, tachycardia, urinary retention. So all the opposites of sludge, basically. May worsen glaucoma and BPH as well. Because, you know, um, acetylcholine innervates the detrusor to contract and uh, urinate. Next will be amantadine. Mechanism of action is increases presynaptic dopamine release and inhibits dopamine reuptake. Indications are low, po low potency anti-Parkinsonian therapy that can help early on with mild symptoms. It improves long-term levodopa-induced dyskinesia. Adverse effects, importantly, of amantadine are levodoreticularis and ankle edema, and you may have some confusion and hallucinations. Next will be selective MAOB inhibitors, selegiline and risalgiline. Mechanism increases dopamine in the striatum, whereas MAOB normally breaks down the dopamine. So if we just inhibit MAOB, there's going to be more dopamine around. Indicated is early therapy with very mild symptoms, and they also may have a neuroprotective effect in uh, Parkinson's. Nausea, headache, confusion, hallucinations as side effects. COMT inhibitors, antacapone and tolcapone, postpones dopamine breakdown. That's what I think of. These are catechol-O-methyltransferase inhibition prevents dopamine breakdown. So postpones dopamine breakdown. Indications, adjunctive treatment with levodopa prolongs the therapeutic dose of levodopa in patients experiencing wearing off periods. It's never used as monotherapy. Since it postpones the breakdown of levodopa, you must have levodopa there anyways. So never as monotherapy with the COMTs. And adverse effects, very important. The same things basically as levodopa, but also tolcapone associated with hepatotoxicity. Next, we'll move into ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also Lou Gehrig's disease. This is neurodegenerative disorder due to necrosis of both upper and lower motor neurons, leading to progressive motor degeneration, idiopathic etiology. This is chromosome 5, whereas Huntington's is chromosome 4. Sensation, voluntary eye movement, sphincter function, bowel and bladder, and sexual function are spared. So very important, sensation, voluntary eye movement, and sphincter function, and sexual function are spared. Manifestations of ALS, asymmetric limb weakness is the most common presenting symptom. Also muscle weakness, loss of ability to initiate and control motor movements. There'll be bulbar symptoms, which are dysphagia, dysarthria, speech problems, difficulty in chewing, and aspiration. There may be some cognitive impairment as well. On physical exam, mixed upper and lower motor neuron signs and symptoms. Upper motor neuron, spasticity, stiffness, hyperreflexia, and weakness. For lower motor neuron, progressive bilateral fasciculations, muscle atrophy, hyporeflexia, and weakness. For diagnosis, EMG, electromyography, loss of neural innervation and re innervation of muscle groups, elevated creatinine phosphokinase, CPK levels as well, due to the muscle breakdown. Management, rilazole, rilazole reduces glutamine buildup in the neurons. This is the only drug known to impact ALS, as it reduces the progression for up to six months. And you may need ventilatory support in advanced disease. So typically it's fatal within three to five years, 
Respiratory failure is the most common cause of death. Although Stephen Hawking lived for like 20 years after. And uh, that's due to aspiration pneumonia, that respiratory failure as the most common cause of death in ALS. Next will be Tourette syndrome, Tourette disorder, vocal, motor, and OCD. Idiopathic movement disorder characterized by vocal tics, motor tics, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Usually onset is in childhood, four to six years, with peak severity at 10 to 12 years, with decreased symptoms in adolescence and significant decrease by adulthood, more common in boys. So most are done by 18 years old. Pathophys is idiopathic, may be due to excess dopamine and GABA deficiency in the caudate nucleus. Clinical manifestations, motor tics, this is the most common initial symptom, usually involving the face, head, or neck, blinking, shrugging, head thrusting, and sniffling. Verbal or phonic tics, grunts, throat clearing, obscene words, which is called corporalalia. Repetitive phrases, repeating the phrases of others, called echolalia. Also self-mutilating tics, like hair pulling, nail biting, biting of the lips, too. Diagnostic criteria in Tourette's, multiple motor and one or more vocal tics, not required to occur concurrently for over one year since the first tick. Frequency may wax and wane as well. So since the start of the first tick, it has to be one year of these multiple motor or one vocal tick. Onset prior to age 18, not caused by a substance or medical condition. Management is habit reversal therapy is first line. Most don't need medical management. So you just want to do that habit reversal therapy. But if you do need medical management, dopamine blocking agents like tetrabenazine, again, a drug used in Huntington's, risperidone, haloperidol, fufenazine, pimazide, alpha-1 adrenergics like clonidine, which is more sedating, or guanfacine, clonazepam also may be used as an adjunctive. Next, cerebral palsy. This is a CNS disorder associated with muscle tone, movement, and postural abnormalities due to brain injury during the perinatal or prenatal period. Types include spastic, dyskinetic, or ataxic. Clinical manifestations, spasticity is hallmark, varying degrees of motor deficits or seizures, often associated with intellectual or learning disabilities and developmental abnormalities. On physical exam, hyperreflexia, limb length discrepancies, congenital defects, and persistent primitive reflexes. For diagnosis, it's primary clinical, primarily clinical, but MRI is required in all patients as well. Management, multidisciplinary approach, pain management, and for spasticity, you could use diazepam and baclofen, or anti-epileptics for seizures. And also a risk factor is moms with cocaine use. Next will be restless leg syndrome also known as willis eckbaum disease, restless leg syndrome, a sleep-related movement disorder. Etiologies, usually primarily idiopathic, but may occur secondary to CNS iron deficiency, very important, CNS iron deficiency, pregnancy, peripheral neuropathy, uremia, chronic alcohol use. Clinical manifestations are uncomfortable or unpleasant sensation, like itching, burning, paresthesias, in legs that creates an urge to move the legs. Symptoms are worse at night with prolonged periods of rest or inactivity. During sleep, periodic limb movements may disturb sleep or cause patients to awake from sleep. Symptoms improve with leg movement. Diagnosis, primarily a clinical diagnosis. Iron workup is usually performed as a part of the underlying cause. And for this, you can use dopamine agonists. The treatment of choice is premipexol or ropinirol. Iron supplementation is recommended in patients with a serum ferritin level lower than 75 micrograms because of the association with iron deficiency in the CNS. You can also use gabapentin or pregabalin. You can also use benzos as well. So restless leg, CNS iron deficiency, improves with leg movement, worse at night. Use dopamine agonists like premipexol or pinarol as well as iron supplementation and gabapentin can be used. Next will be Bell's palsy. Idiopathic unilateral cranial nerve 7 facial nerve palsy leading to hemifacial weakness and paralysis 
due to inflammation and compression. This is actually a lower motor neuron disorder. And also remember the facial nerve is the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and some ear movement as well. So although idiopathic may be related to herpes simplex virus reactivation, risk factors are diabetics, pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, post upper respiratory infection, and dental nerve block as well. Clinical manifestations, sudden onset of ipsilateral hyperacusis, ear pain, which coincides with that ear uh, involvement of the seventh cranial nerve, 24 to 48 hours followed by unilateral facial weakness or paralysis involving the forehead, unable to lift the affected eyebrow, wrinkled forehead, smile, loss of nasal labial fold, drooping of the corner of the mouth, also taste disturbance due to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue involvement, biting of the inner cheek, eye irritation due to decreased lacrimation and inability to fully close the eyelid. So remember the facial nerve also um, has a role in the lacrimal gland motor function. So the bell phenomenon, the eye on the affected side moves laterally and superiorly when the eye closure is attempted. The weakness and paralysis only affects the face. So remember that sudden onset with hyperacusis ear pain, followed by the rest of the manifestations. So the diagnosis is of exclusion, and no treatment is actually required. Over 85% of the cases resolve within one month. Supportive treatment, artificial tears, which replaces lacrimation, reduces vision problems. Eye patches can be worn during sleep if severe to prevent corneal ulceration. Prednisone can be used, especially if it started within the first 72 hours of symptom onset, reduces the time to full recovery, and increases the likelihood for complete recuperation. Acyclovir in combination with glucocorticoids in severe cases has been shown to improve symptoms and timing of recovery, especially if it's due to herpes simplex virus reactivation. So next will be Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS. Acquired autoimmune demyelinating polyradiculopathy of the peripheral nervous system. Pathophysiology is autoantibodies attack the myelin sheath of the peripheral nerves. Molecular mimicry after an infection. The etiologies are importantly an increased incidence with Campylobacter jejuni, which is most common, or other antecedent GI or respiratory infections like CMV, EBV, HIV, mycoplasma infections, um, as well as post-surgical. Clinical manifestations, symmetric ascending weakness and sensory changes, paresthesias and pain in the distal lower extremities first, very important may develop weakness of the respiratory muscles as it ascends and bulbar muscles due to swallowing abnormalities. So it's the four A's, ascending, areflexic as its lower motor neuron, afebrile in an antecedent event, which is that most common, Campylobacter jejuni. For physical exam, for lower motor neuron signs, you'll have that decreased DTRs, flaccid paralysis and weakness, sensory deficits, cranial nerve palsies like cranial nerve seven, remember, is a lower motor neuron, autonomic dysfunction, tachycardia, arrhythmias, hypotension, and hypertension could be possible, breathing difficulties as well. For diagnosis is electrophysiologic studies in EMG, which is nerve conduction studies and needle electromyography. Decreased motor conduction um, in velocities and amplitude is most specific. CSF analysis, importantly, will show a high protein with a normal white blood cell count, usually seen one to three weeks after symptom onset. This is that albuminocytologic dissociation. Pulmonary function tests, PFTs, is important to assess peak inspiratory pressure and force vital capacity, both decreased in GBS, most important to determine the need for intubation. For management, plasmapheresis or IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, our first line. This helps with antibody removal and neutralization. So plasmapheresis, IVIG, mechanical ventilation if respiratory involvement, noted on um, functional vital capacity or PFTs, and prednisone is not indicated in the management of GBS. It's autoimmune disease, but uh, no prednisone for this one. Prognosis is 60%, a full recovery in one year, and also 10 to 20% are left with permanent disability. So also do DVT prophylaxis since the limbs are not moving with enoxaparin and avoid narcotics for pain. You can use gabapentin or carbamazepine instead. 
for things on the differential, think about B12 deficiency, um, spinal injury, spinal compression, polio, West Nile virus, or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Next will be myasthenia gravis. This is an autoimmune peripheral nerve disorder due to autoantibodies against the acetylcholine receptor on the muscles leading to weakness, symmetrical weakness. Most common in young women under 40 and older men over 50. Strong association with abnormal thymus gland, hyperplasia or a thymoma, in 75% of patients. Also an HLA-B8 and DR3. Remember, no sensory abnormalities for myasthenia gravis. It's the acetylcholine receptor which is leading to the muscles. So pathophys, again, autoantibodies against acetylcholine, nicotinic postsynaptic receptor at the neuromuscular junction, causes decreased skeletal muscle neuromuscular transmission with muscle recovery after a period of rest. Clinical manifestations, two main clinical manifestations, ocular weakness, ptosis, and generalized weakness. The weakness is worsened after repetitive muscle use throughout the day. So it uses up all the acetylcholine, <laughs> acetylcholine and none is left. Ocular weakness, diplopia and ptosis, usually the first presenting symptoms, and the pupils are spared. Generalized muscle weakness, bulbar or pharyngeal weakness, weakness with prolonged chewing, dysphagia, dysphonia, and dysarthria. Respiratory muscle weakness may lead to respiratory failure, which is a myasthenic crisis. So diagnosis in the outpatient setting, you can do acetylcholine receptor antibodies, is the best initial test of choice. MUSK, M-U-S-K antibodies, should be obtained if the ACR antibodies are negative, acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Also electrophysiology testing, repetitive nerve stimulation or electromyography, the most accurate test for myasthenia gravis. For chest imaging, chest x-ray, CT or MRI, done in all patients to detect thymus gland abnormalities, remembering that it was, they're having concurrent thymus gland abnormalities in 75% of the cases. So diagnosis in the emergent setting, you want to do that idrophonium tensilon test, in which you'll see brief improvement of symptoms after administration. So it's essentially a fast-working acetylcholine ester ACE inhibitor that increases acetylcholine rapidly and then it goes back. So it at least helps you make that diagnosis. Ice pack test, also application of ice for 10 minutes helps improve ocular symptoms which may aid in the diagnosis. Management, myasthenic crisis or severe, plasmapheresis or IVIG. Long-term acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like peridostigmine or neostigmine. First line in treatment um, of symptoms, glucocorticoids, azathioprine, which is a steroid sparing agent, increases the life of the steroids, and cyclosporin if steroids um, aren't working. Also, you could do a thymectomy, especially if they're under 60 years old. Even if the thymus gland is normal, it can improve symptoms and removes the source of antibodies. Useful if no improvement with medical management, and do glucocorticoids if over 60 years old. Avoid medications known to exacerbate myasthenia gravis, like fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides, and beta blockers. So to go into more depth of a couple of the drugs used in myasthenia gravis, these will be the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, peridostigmine and neostigmine. The mechanism, again, is acetylcholinesterase inhibition, prevents acetylcholine breakdown in the synapse. So the goal here is to oversaturate and beat out the, auto, uh, the autoimmune antibodies in and taking up that space. Indications are first line management in myasthenia gravis. Idrophonium is a short acting drug that is used for diagnostic purposes as we said. Adverse effects are of course cholinergic, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, sweating, nausea, vomiting. So that's your sludge symptoms, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, um, GI symptoms, and emesis. Um, Cholinergic crisis, again, excess medication leading to weakness, nausea, vomiting, paler, sweating, salivation, diarrhea, meiosis, bradycardia, and respiratory failure. So the treatment for a cholinergic crisis actually would be atropine as it inhibits the parasympathetic, and acetylcholine is parasympathetic as well. So, of course, also used in bradyarrhythmias. Next, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, LEMS. So antibot antibot 
antibodies against presynaptic voltage-gated calcium channels, prevents acetylcholine release, leading to muscle weakness, most commonly associated with small cell lung cancer and other malignancies. Clinical manifestations is also proximal muscle weakness that improves with repeated muscle use, unlike myasthenia gravis, so it's the opposite. The weakness may cause difficulty arising from a chair, gait alterations, and managing stairs. There'll be some autonomic symptoms such as dry mouth as the most common, hypotension. Um, physical examination will be hyporeflexia, sluggish pupillary response, but no muscle atrophy. Diagnosis is a voltage-gated calcium channel antibody assay, and electrophysiology will be reproducible post-exercise increase in compound muscle activation on repeated nerve stimulation testing. So basically, it just gets better as the movement increases. CT scan to assess for underlying malignancy. You want to do a CT of the chest. Management is treat the underlying malignancy. You want to do a CT, oh, CT of the chest also to rule out small cell lung cancer. The initial medical management, pyridostigmine as well, and second line, plasmapheresis, IVIG, oral immunosuppressants. So also know about botulism, we'll have that descending paralysis as opposed to ascending, and also fixed pupils. Next will be multiple sclerosis. This is an autoimmune inflammatory demyelinating disease of the CNS of idiopathic origin. It's associated with axon degeneration of the white matter, brain and spinal cord, the white myelin sheath it destroys. Most common in women and young adults 20 to 40, also colder climates, and HLA-DR2. So it's an upper motor neuron, but it destroys motor and sensory. Three main types are the relapsing remitting disease, which is most common, which has episodic exacerbations. Also the progressive disease, progressive decline without acute exacerbations, and secondary progressive, which is relapsing remitting pattern that becomes progressive. Clinical manifestations are sensory disturbances, followed by weakness and visual disturbances are the most common presenting symptoms. Sensory deficits like pain and paresthesias, also motor deficits like weakness, gait and balance problems, visual disturbances, diplopia, optic neuritis, fatigue, trigeminal neuralgia, and UTOFS phenomenon, which is worsening of the symptoms with heat, which is exercise, fever, hot baths, or weather, spinal cord symptoms, bladder or bowel dysfunction. Physical exam will be an upper motor neuron signs, spasticity, an upward Babinski, hyperreflexia, and muscle rigidity. Lermitz sign, is a neck flexion caused by a lightning shock type pain radiating from the spine down to the leg. So Lemitz is lightning down to the leg. Marcus gun pupil with optic neuritis. So during the swinging flashlight test from the unaffected eye into the affected eye, the pupils appear to dilate due to less than normal pupillary restriction. This response is due to the brain perceiving the delayed conduction of affected optic nerve as if the light was reduced. Also internuclei ophthalmoplegia, inability to adduct the eyes on the side of the lesion with nystagmus in the other eye. Cerebellar, you may have Charcot's neurologic triad, which is nystagmus, staccato speech, and intentional tremor. Also ataxia. Spinal cord symptoms like bladder, bowel, or sexual dysfunction. For diagnosis, mainly clinical, at least two distinct episodes of CNS deficits. MRI with gadolinium is the best initial and most accurate test. You'll see hyperintense white matter plaques are the hallmark finding. And for this, there should be proof of at least two areas of white matter involvement before the diagnosis is made. For a lumbar puncture, it's indicated if you have a negative MRI. For LP, you'll see increased IgG and illegal clonal bands. Small discrete bands in the gamma globulin region seen in electrophoresis, which reflects inflammatory cells penetrating the blood brain barrier. Management for acute exacerbation IV glucocorticoids are the first line treatment, high dose methylprednisolone, also plasmapheresis if not responsive to the glucocorticoids. Prevention of relapse and progression beta interferon or glatiramir are first line. Natalizumab may cause progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, 
Also, amantadine is helpful for fatigue symptoms. And black baclofen, baclofen or diazepam for spasticity. So acute glucocorticoids, plasmapheresis, um, relapse and progression, beta interferon, glutiramir, and you could do baclofen, diazepam, or amantadine as well. Next, we'll move to astrocytoma. This is derived from the astrocytes. The astrocytes are the star-shaped glial cells of the brain and spinal cord that support the endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier. They provide nutrients for the cells, maintain extracellular ion balance, and also repair the brain after injury. They can appear at any part of the brain, most often infratentorial in children, supratentorial in adults. So that's infratentorial is below the cortex, so the cerebellum. So types of astrocytomas. Pilocytic astrocytoma, grade 1, which is a juvenile astrocytoma, is typically localized, and it's considered the most benign, non-cancerous of all astrocytomas. Most common in children and young adults, other grade 1 astrocytomas include cerebellar astrocytoma and desmoplastic infantile. There's also diffuse astrocytoma, which is a grade 2 or low grade. This can be composed of um, the uh, tendency to invade surrounding tissues but grow at a relatively slow pace. There's anaplastic astrocytoma, which is rare but aggressive, which is grade 3. And grade 4 is a glioblastoma multiform. And this is the most common primary CNS tumor in all adults. So, also the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, which is ventricular tumors associated with tuberous sclerosis. So this pilocytic, grade 1, diffuse astrocytoma, grade 2, anaplastic astrocytoma, grade 3. And grade 4 is glioblastoma multiform, which is the most common of all. For clinical mass manifestations of these astrocytomas, focal deficits are the most common, depending on the location of the lesion, most common in the frontal and temporal areas. There'll be general symptoms like headache, um, might be worse in the mornings, may wake the patients up at night as well, and may be positional. So that's a common one I saw in the question, may wake the patient up at night for the headaches. Increased intracranial pressure due to the mass effect. They can have, again, a headache, nausea, vomiting, papilledema, ataxia, stupor. For diagnosis, CT or MRI with contrast, grade 1 and 2 are non-enhancing, and grade 3 and 4 are enhancing. Brain biopsy, usually guided by imaging studies. Histologic appearance includes pilocytic astrocytomas, again at grade 1, which generally forms a sac of fluids as it's cystic, pilocystic or may be enclosed within a cyst. They're usually slow growing, but can become very large. They'll have the classic Rosenthal fibers, which are eosinophilic corkscrew fibers. For diffuse astrocytomas, they'll have microcysts and mucus-like fluid. They're grouped by their appearance and behavior of cells by which they're named. Anaplastic astrocytomas, tentacle-like projections that grow into surrounding tissue making them difficult to completely remove during surgery. So, worse prognosis with uh, anaplastic, kind of like anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, bad prognosis. Astrocytoma grade 4, glioblastoma, which may contain cystic material, calcium deposits, blood vessels, or a mixed grade of cells. That's the most common one too, astrocytoma grade 4, glioblastoma. So, management, surgical excision for pilocystic, in adults or older children, radiation, diffuse surgery um, or radiation, anaplastic surgery, radiation plus chemo, astrocytoma grade 4, the glioblastoma, surgery, radiation, chemo. Glioblastoma multiform, most common and most aggressive primary malignant CNS tumor in adults, importantly. Glioblastoma equals a grade 4 astrocytoma. Again, a, her a heterogeneous mixture of poorly differentiated astrocytes. Risk factors are males over 50, um, human herpes virus 6, CMV, and ionizing radiation. There's two types, primary and secondary. Primary glioblastoma multiform is most common. It's seen in adults over 50, arises de novo, most common and most aggressive. Secondary is 40%, and they're most common under 45 years old and it's due to malignant progression from a low-grade astrocytoma, such as a grade 2 diffuse, or anaplastic grade 3.
may transform in one year or even over 10 years. There's some variants, which are classic, 97%. Um, presence of extra copies of the epidermal growth factor receptor gene. Okay. Mesenchymal have high rates of mutations and alterations, such as genes encoding for neurofibromatosis type 1. And clinical manifestations of, these, of this glioblastoma multiform are focal deficits, depending on the location. Again, frontal and temporal, most common. Generally, a headache, which wakes them up at night. Potentially the most uh, important thing to know. Um, fixed dilated pupils, cranial nerve 3 palsy, altered mental status, other neurologic changes. For diagnosis, brain MRI with contrast is the initial study of choice. Classic findings in glioblastoma multiform are a heterogeneous lesion with variable rings of enhancement with central necrosis surrounded by edema and irregular serpinginous margins. Mass effect may cause hydrocephalus, may cross the corpus callosum in a butterfly glioma. Histology, usually post-surgical, you'll see hemorrhagic center surrounded by pseudo-palisading, tumor cells lining the area of necrosis. Management, surgical excision, radiation, and chemo. Next will be a meningioma. This is a usually benign, slow-growing tumor arising from the arachnoid meningothelial cells of the meninges covering the brain and spinal cord. And most commonly arising from the dura, or sites of dural reflection, such as the venous sinuses and falx cerebri. Risk factor is females, estrogen receptor on the tumor sites, and radiation. Manifestations, symptoms are due to compression and displacement of the brain, usually does not invade the brain parenchyma itself. Again, seizures or focal neurosigns, depending on the location. Fixed dilated pupil, importantly, in cranial nerve 3, palsies. Um, for diagnosis of meningioma, MRI with contrast is preferred. Extra axial intense enhancing, well-defined lesion often attached to the dura, resembling a snowball, may have increased calcifications. So to identify this one, you know that it's attached to the meninges itself. So histology, spindle cells, concentrically arranged in a rolled pattern, and also somoma bodies, con uh, concentric round calcifications. Management, asymptomatic, observe, symptomatic surgical excision. So meningioma arises from the dura. You see the whorled pattern, the somoma bodies, and uh, you do an MRI with contrast and see that it's attached to the dura itself with calcifications. Next, CNS lymphoma. Primary and secondary. Primary is seen without evidence of systemic disease. It's a variant of extranodal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, NHL. Secondary is more common, though. Secondary is METs from another site, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the neck, chest, groin, or abdomen, especially diffuse large B-cell Lympho, lymphoma, 90%. Also, Burkitt's can be 10%. So, especially METs from diffuse large cell B lymphoma. So, just think B for brain. Risk factors, Epstein-Barr virus in 90% of patients. Immunosuppression, AIDS, post-transplant. Clinical manifestations, focal neurodeficits, also ocular symptoms. Diagnosis, CT or MRI with contrast. You'll see the hypo-intense ring-enhanced lesion in the deep white matter on CT. You can also do biopsy. Management is chemo with methotrexate as the most effective chemotherapy. And you should also give leucovorin due to its uh, anti-folic acid properties. So that's folinic acid, which is leucovorin. Next will be oligodendroglioma. Oligodendroglioma. Oligodendrocytes, the type of cell that makes up the supportive glial tissues in the brain, these tumors can be found anywhere within the cerebral hemispheres, especially in the frontal and temporal lobes, may be asymptomatic, grow slowly, focal deficits again, diagnosis, brain biopsy, CT or MRI, histolo histologic appearance, calcified tumors, chicken wire capillary pattern with a fried egg-shaped tumor seen within, with a microscope. So that's the chicken wire capillary pattern with a fried egg-shaped tumor seen on microscope. Surgical excision and chemo for oligodendrocytoma.
a leg or rather a legodendroglioma. Ependioma. Um, ependy ependymal cells that line the ventricles and part of the spinal cord. So they're most common in children. Mean diagnosis is five years of age. In the ependymoma, ependymal cells, most commonly seen in the fourth ventricle, spinal cord, and medulla, may have caught it in quina in adults. Clinical manifestations, infants, um, increase of head size, irritability, sleeplessness, vomiting, um, other focal neuro signs. CT with MRI, again, brain biopsy, sees perivascular pseudo-rosettes. <coughs> Tumor cells surrounding a blood vessel. So that's for ependioma. Perivascular pseudo-rosettes. Management is surgical resection, adjuvant radiation. Chemo is not usually helpful. Next for hemangiomas. Hemangioma is an abnormal buildup of blood vessels in the skin or internal organs, 2% of all primary brain tumors. Also know von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, 10%. Hemangiomas, tumors of the liver, pancreas, and kidney. Hemangioblastoma arises from blood vessel linings. Benign, slow-growing, well-defined tumors, most common found in the posterior fossa, the brainstem, and the cerebellum may occur in the cerebral hemispheres or spinal cord, and note retinal hemangiomas are associated with the von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Clinical manifestations are neuro defects and diagnosis, CT or MRI, biopsy, and foam cells with high vascularity will be found on biopsy. Foam cells with high vascularity. Management, surgical resection, and radiation may be done. Next will be neurocognitive disorders, delirium, which is an acute, abrupt, transient, confused state due to, due to an identifiable cause like medications, infections, electrolyte abnormalities, CNS injury, uremia, organ failure, illicit drug intoxication, or withdrawal, rapid onset associate, associated with fluctuating mental status, and marked deficit in short-term memory usually associated with a full recovery within one week in most cases. Alzheimer's dementia. This is the most common type of dementia. Risk factors are an increased age, genetics, and a family history. So remember, tau proteins, amyloid plaques, and neurofibrillary tangles for Alzheimer's dementia. So for pathophysiology of Alzheimer's, it's unknown, but there's three hypotheses. One is amyloid hypothesis. This is extracellular amyloid beta protein deposition, senile plaques, in the brain, which are neurotoxic. This is also the tau protein hypothesis, neurofibrillary tangles, hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, which are neurotoxic, and the three, cholinergic hypothesis. <clears throat> Acetylcholine deficiency leads to memory, language, and visual spatial changes. Clinical manifestations, short-term memory loss, often first symptom, progresses to long-term memory loss and cognitive deficits, disorientation, behavioral or personality changes, language difficulties, loss of motor skills, etc., usually gradual in nature. For diagnosis of Alzheimer's, it's a clinical diagnosis with no specific test, although workup to rule out other causes includes an MRI, CBC, renal and LFTs, VDRL or RPR to rule out syphilis, B12, and thyroid functional studies. The MRI is the preferred neuroimaging test, and it will show cortical atrophy, the medial temporal lobe atrophy, reduced hippocampal volume, and white matter lesions. So medial temporal lobe atrophy, importantly, seen on the MRI. And that's a cortical atrophy. Histologic findings, amyloid beta protein deposition, again the senile plaques, in the brain. Amyloid precursor proteins, APP, are normally de um, degraded by alpha cleavage. Beta cleavage of APP results in amyloid beta accumulation. The neurofibrillary tangles are intracellular aggregations of tau proteins, an insoluble cytoskeletal microtubule element. Medical management of Alzheimer's, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, donepezil, tacrine, rivastigmine, and galantamine. These are used to improve memory function and symptom relief. 
does not slow down the progression of the disease, however. <clears throat> so they decrease the amount of acetylcholine uptaken, so basically increases choline. NMDA ag antagonists like memantine can be used adjunctively or used as a monotherapy in moderate to severe disease. The mechanism is inhibits glutamine excito um, excitotoxicity, so blocks NMDA receptors, slowing calcium influx and nerve damage. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter of the NMDA receptor. Excitotoxicity causes cell death. NMDA antagonists reduce glutamate excitotoxicity and this may be adjunctive as well. Next will be vascular dementia. This is bra a brain disease due to chronic ischemia and multiple infarctions, lacunar infarctions, to the small vessels. Hypertension is the most important risk factor, diabetes, history of CVA, and AFib as well. Clinical manifestations, a sudden decline in function with a stepwise progression of symptoms, random infarct, then decline, stable, then another infarct, then decline. So there's also cortical manifestations depending on the areas affected. If it's medial frontal, you may have executive dysfunction, apathy, abulia, left parietal, apraxia, aphasia or agnosia, right parietal, hemineglect, confusion, visual spatial abnormalities. <clears throat> For subcortical manifestations, focal motor deficits, gait abnormalities, urinary difficulties, personality changes. For diagnosis of vascular dementia, clinically, also work up for Alzheimer's disease. Rule out other causes of symptoms like B12, infolate, RPR, etc. The MRI will show white matter lesions, cortical or subcortical infarcts, and the CT may show lacunar infarcts. Prevention, strict blood pressure control. There's also frontotemporal dementia, which is also called PICS disease. This is localized brain de uh, degeneration of the frontotemporal lobes, may progress globally as well. Clinical manifestations are a marked changes in social behavior, personality, and language, aphasia, and are earlier signs of frontotemporal dementia with eventual uh, executive and memory dysfunction, dementia with, with advanced disease. The onset of dementia is earlier than Alzheimer's disease, usually presents in the sixth decade. So they have marked behavioral changes as well. Disinhibition or socially inappropriate behaviors, apathy, hyperorality, like binge eating, changes in food preferences, putting large amounts of food in their mouth, also compulsive ritualistic behaviors, loss of sympathy and apathy. Physical exam, preserved visual spatial. In advanced diseases, they may have positive primitive reflexes and they may have Parkinsonism. On histology, they have PIC bodies, PIC bodies, which are round or oval aggregates of tau protein seen on silver staining of the cortex itself. So frontotemporal is PIC's disease, um, changes in personality, social and behavior, and language, and it starts earlier. Diffuse Lewy body disease, progressive dementia characterized by diffuse presence of Lewy bodies which are abnormal neuronal protein depositions in, the, in comparison to Parkinson's disease, where the Lewy bodies are localized. So in Parkinson's, the Lewy bodies are localized in the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia. However, in diffuse Lewy body disease, this is progressive dementia characterized by diffuse presence of Lewy bodies. Clinical manifestations are core features that occur early, especially visual hallucinations. Also, episodic delirium, cognitive fluctuations, and Parkinsonism with rapid eye movement sleep disorder. Dementia is a late finding, delusions, sensitivity to antipsychotic drugs, especially, and autonomic dysfunction, such as orthostatic hypotension. On, his, on histology, cortical Lewy bodies, abnormal deposition of the alpha synuclein proteins, not the basal ganglia or the substantia nigra. Treatment uh, of the Parkinson symptoms may worsen the neuropsychiatric symptoms and vice versa. So diffuse Lewy body, know that it's diffuse as opposed to localized in Parkinson's. They have visual hallucinations, co cognitive fluctuations, autonomic dysfunction, and also the alpha-synuclein proteins. Focal partial seizure is next. <clears throat> 
abnormal neuronal discharge from one discrete section in one hemisphere. With retained awareness is called simple, where consciousness is fully maintained. With impaired awareness is complex, with consciousness impaired. Clinical manifestations of a focal partial seizure is focal sensory, motor, or autonomic symptoms, depending on the lobe affected. May be followed by a uh, neurologic deficit, Todd's paralysis, lasting up to 24 hours. So Todd's paralysis is in the focal partial seizures. Motor symptoms may be a jerky rhythmic movement, may start in one area, focal, and then spread to other parts um, affecting the limb or the body, which is classically called the Jacksonian march. May be tonic with muscular rigidity or rhythmic jerking. Sensory, paresthesias, numbness, pain, heat, cold, sensation to movement, olfactory, flashing lights. For autonomic, abdominal, cardiovascular, blood pressure changes, bronchoconstriction, etc. Aurors and automatisms they may have. So repetitive behaviors like lip smacking, facial grimacing, chewing, manual picking, coordinated movements or repeating words that may accompany complex partial seizures. So automatisms, complex partial seizures. Initial workup is to rule out reversible causes. You want to get a CBC, CMP, electrolytes, liver and renal, and RPR. MRI to rule out a focal mass as well. For EEG, for simple partial, you see focal discharge at the onset of the seizure. And for complex partial, you see interictal spikes or with slow waves in the temporal or frontotemporal area. So for focal partial seizures, don't forget with retained awareness is simple, with impaired awareness is complex, and don't forget Todd's paralysis lasts up to 24 hours. Don't forget the changing one symptom in one area moves to another, which is the Jacksonian march, and the automatisms, which are the repetitive behaviors, are in complex partial. So next will be absence or petite mal seizure, generalized seizure involving both hemispheres, most common in early childhood. Age at onset is usually 4 to 10 years, often ceases by early puberty or 20 years of age in most patients. Clinical manifestations are a pause or a stare, sudden marked impairment in consciousness without loss of body tone. The patient remains upright. Staring episodes with pauses, behavioral arrest. Episodes typically last between 5 and 10 seconds. If they're over 10 seconds, it can be associated with an eyelid twitching or lip smacking. There's no post-ictal phase, and it may occur up to 10 times per day. It may be associated with automatisms, predominantly oral or myoclonus, and also may be provoked by hyperventilation. Importantly, on EEG, you'll see the bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike in wave activity. So bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike in wave activity for absence seizures, and management, ethosuximide is the first line management for absence seizures. Next will be generalized grand mal seizures. These are simultaneous neuronal discharge from both hemispheres, diffuse brain involvement, generalized tonic-clonic, grand mal, most common type. The clinical manifestations are tonic-clonic, sudden loss of consciousness with tonic activity, contraction and rigidity that may be associated with respiratory arrest, followed by one to two minutes of clonic activity, repetitive rhythmic Symmetric jerking lasting under three minutes, followed by a post-ictal confusion phase. Cyanosis and urinary incontinence may occur, importantly. Cyanosis and urinary incontinence may occur. For the clonic phase, this is repetitive rhythmic jerking, usually lasting under two to three minutes, often associated with a post-ictal state. Could be myoclonic. Myoclonic is sudden, brief, sporadic, involuntary twitching maybe one muscle group or a group of muscles, no loss of consciousness, tonic, loss of consciousness followed by rigidity, atonic, sudden partial or complete loss of muscle or postural tone, drop attacks are atonic. And again, it could be absence as well. Non-convulsive brief lapse of consciousness with brief staring episodes with or without a loss of postural tone. Diagnosis is initial workup to rule out reversible causes again. Very important. That's the first best step. CBC, electrolytes, liver, renal, and RPR. Also known increased prolactin and lactic acid immediately after the seizure 
may be helpful to rule out pseudo seizures, so see if they're faking it or not. MRI to rule out a focal mass. So lactic acid will be if there's actually, I guess, cells breaking down, and also prolactin. EEG, generalized high amplitude, rapid spiking during episodes active of tonic-clonic seizures. For management, treat the underlying cause if it's known. Long-term options for epilepsy include levetiracetam, phenytoin, valproic acid, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenobarbital, topiramate, um, levetiracetam, and lamotrigine are the safest in pregnancy. Ethosuximide, again, first line for absence, and valproate, um, second line for absence. Next, status epilepticus. A single continuous epileptic seizure lasting five minutes or greater for more than one minute within a five minute period without recovery in between episodes. This is considered a neurologic emergency. Etiologies could be structural abnormalities, infections like meningitis or encephalitis, metabolic abnormalities, medications or toxins. Also non-compliance with your AEDs. Diagnosis, neuroimaging, once stabilized to determine if intracranial mass or hemorrhage is present. And management, most important, ABCs and airway management first. Benzodiazepines are the preferred initial agents. Lorazepam is usually preferred. They are associated with a rapid control of seizure. Additional doses may be given. Midazolam can be used as well, IM, if IV access cannot be established. Second line is phenytoin or phosphenytoin if no response to benzos. They can also be used to prevent recurrence. Valproate and levetiracetam are alternatives. For third line, if that's not working, then you can do phenobarbital if no response to phenytoin. Phenobarbital is a barbiturate. And this is if it's refractory. General anesthesia, midazolam, and propofol can be used. Complications, hypoxia, aspiration, respiratory failure, and cardiac arrhythmias. So know the order of management. Of course, your ABCs and airway management. Benzos, first line. Lorazepam's the best. Second line, phenytoin, phosphenytoin. You can also use valproate and levetiracetam. And third line, phenobarbital, if no response to phenytoin. So next, go into some of the different drugs used in epilepsy. First, phenytoin. The mechanism of phenytoin is stabilizes neuronal membranes by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels. Indications are generalized tonic-clonic and focal seizures, simple and complex, also seizure prophylaxis, status epilepticus after benzodiazepines as well. Side effects are can be spelled out using the monic phenytoin. For P, it's P450 inducer and induces lupus-like syndrome. H, hyperplasia of the gums and hirsutism. E, erythema multiform, also Steven Johnson. N, neuropathies like vertigo, ataxia, headache. Y, if you don't yield, if you don't give it slow, it causes hypotension and arrhythmias. T, teratogenicity like cleft lip and palate and microcephaly. O, osteopenia. I, inhibits folic acid absorption, megaloblastic anemia, and nystagmus. Next will be carbamazepine. The mechanism of action of carbamazepine is it blocks sodium channels, decreasing seizure spread by increasing the refractory period of the channels. And remember, this is a treatment for trigeminal neuralgia and also bipolar disorder. Indications, generalized tonic-clonic and focal seizures, simple and complex. Drug of choice for, again, trigeminal neuralgia, bipolar disorder, is second line. Central DI, which is second line after desmopressin. Nephrodi is HCTZ. Adverse effects are hyponatremia, so it basically causes SIADH. Steven Johnson syndrome is also an adverse effect. And you want to test for the HLA-B1502 genetic susceptibility marker in Asians associated with an increased risk of developing SJS. Further adverse effects, dizziness, diplopia, ataxia, drowsiness. Also importantly, hepatotoxicity increases LFTs, and also blood dyscrasias, agranulocytosis, aplastic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Teratogenicity again, and, induce it, and it's an inducer of the P450 and drug-induced lupus. Contraindications, no use in absence, petite mal seizures, and it can worsen absence seizures. Next will be ethosuximide. 
The mechanism of action is it blocks calcium channels, leading to motor cortex depression, elevates the stimulation threshold, decreasing neuronal firing. It's the drug of choice for absence or petite mal seizures. Can only be used in absence seizures. Adverse effects, drowsiness, Steven Johnson syndrome, GI upset. You want to monitor your analysis, CBCs, LFTs. Phenobarbital, which is, again, third line in uh, status epilepticus. This is a barbiturate that binds to GABA receptors and potentiates GABA-mediated CNS inhibition. Indications are partial and complex or generalized. Status epilepticus after phenytoin administration. And no further side effects can be depression, SJS, and many more. Benzodiazepines, lorazepam, diazepam. The mechanism of action potentiates GABA-mediated CNS inhibition. Lorazepam is the most effective and has a shorter half-life than diazepam. Functions as an anxiolytic, sedative hypnotic, anticonvulsant, and muscle relaxant. Indications generalized in absence, anxiety, sedation, muscle spasm. First line for acute generalized tonic-clonic seizures and status epilepticus. And also remember... Um, alcohol withdrawal, delirium tremens, and eclampsia, where current seizures after magnesium sulfate has been administered. Adverse effects are sedation, ataxia, paradoxical reaction as well, monitor blood pressure after IV admin, and contraindications are suicide risk. Next will be valproic acid, or divalproic sodium. It has multiple mechanisms, potentiates GABA, also inhibits glutamate and NMDA receptors and increases refractory period of voltage-gated sodium channels. Indications are uh, partial, simple and complex, generalized, tonic-clonic and absence. First line for myoclonic seizures. Migraine prophylaxis as well and bi um, bipolar disorder. Adverse effects, importantly, pancreatitis, hepatotoxicity. It's also very teratogenic. Due to neural tube defects, valproate has the highest risk of birth defects of any of the commonly used anti-epileptic drugs. Valproate should not be should be avoided if patients is not already on, on it prior to pregnancy. Tremor also. For topiramate, topamax, multiple actions, blocks sodium channels, increases GABA activity, glutamate receptor antagonists. It can be used for migraine prophylaxis, generalized and partial seizures. Adverse effects are renal stones, and also weight loss. Gabapentin mechanism is inhibits voltage-gated calcium channels. It's structurally similar to GABA, but works on calcium channels, not GABA itself. Indications, partial and complex, peripheral neuropathy, and neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, post-herpetic neuralgia as well. Adverse effects, it can worsen absent seizures like carbamazepine as well, sedation and ataxia. Next, lacunar infarcts. This is small vessel disease of the penetrating branches of the cerebral arteries in the pons and basal ganglia. It's a subset of a TIA. 80% have a history of hypertension, and some have diabetes as well. It can lead to vascular dementia as well. There's five classic presentations of lacunar infarcts. There's pure motor which is the most common presentation. This leads to hemiparesis or hemiplegia in the absence of sensory or cortical signs. Cortical signs are aphasia, agnosia, neglect, apraxia, or hemianopsia. There's also ataxic hemiparesis, which is ipsilateral weakness and clumsiness in the legs more than the arms. There's pure sensory deficits. There's sensory motor. There's dysarthria, which is clumsy hand syndrome. And for diagnosis of lacunar infarcts, you want to do a CT and see small, punched out, hypodense areas, which are the lacunar infarcts, usually in the central and non cortical areas, such as the basal ganglia. So, central and non cortical areas. These are the deep penetrating vessels in the pons and the basal ganglia, again, not the cortex. Management aspirin control risk factors like hypertension, most importantly and also diabetes. They do have a good prognosis with partial or complete deficit resolution ranging up from hours to six weeks.
Okay, transient ischemic attacks, transient episodes of neurologic deficits caused by a focal brain, spinal cord, or retinal ischemia without acute infarction. Three main types, embolic, such as AFib, left ventricular thrombosis as well through the PFO. Lacunar, again, penetrating small vessels that are not in the cortex. Large arteries, ischemia due to atherosclerosis. Clinical manifestations of TIAs are neurologic deficits lasting under 24 hours is the definition. Depending on the artery involved, it resembles a stroke pattern. Most, however, last for a few minutes with complete resolution within one hour. You have amaurosis fugo, which is a transient monocular vision loss, which is the classic temporary shade down of one eye, curtains coming down. Physical exam will have a carotid brewy may be heard. And for diagnosis, neuroimaging plus neurovascular imaging also rule out cardioembolic source. Neuroimaging and CT scan performed initially to rule out hemorrhage, but an MRI is more sensitive. For neurovascular imaging, you can do the CT or MR angiography, and as well as carotid Doppler. Conventional angiography is the definitive diagnosis, however it's invasive. And for ancillary testing, you want to rule out cardioembolic sources, so you want to get an EKG, telemetry, and echo. Rule out metabolic or hematologic causes of neurologic symptoms, like hypoglycemia or CBC. For management of a TIA, place the patient in the supine position to increase cerebral perfusion. Avoid lowering blood pressure unless it's over 220 over 120. Thrombolytics are contraindicated, however, in TIAs. Non-cardiogenic TIA. Antiplatelet therapy is what you want to do. First-line medical management, aspirin and clopidogrel, or aspirin plus, or aspirin plus dipyridamol or ticlopidine. Carotid endarterectomy is recommended if internal carotid stenosis, 50 to 99%, with a life expectancy of at least five years left. Long-term, reduce the risk factors like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. Also, exercise. Cardiogenic or atrial fibrillation, you want to do oral anticoagulation. So it's important to know the ABCD2 score assessment in TIAs. This is the risk of stroke after a TIA is significantly increased, and the risk is highest during the days immediately following the TIA. The ABCD2 tool designed to predict the risk of stroke in the 3 to 90 days after a TIA. Patients receive one point for each A, age over 60, B, blood pressure over 140 over 90, C, clinical symptoms, so one point for slurred speech and two points for unilateral weakness, D, duration, one point for over 10 minutes or two points for over 60 minutes, and remember by definition it's under 24 hours, and D, diabetes, so duration and diabetes. So if they have zero to three points, there's a 3% 90-day stroke risk. If they have 4 to 5 points, there's a 10% 90-day stroke risk. If they have 6 to 7 points, there's almost a 20% 90-day stroke risk, so 17.8%. Now moving to ischemic strokes themselves. These are acute onset neurologic deficits due to death, due to death of brain tissue from ischemia. Ischemia is the most common type of stroke at 80%. Causes include thrombotic and embolic strokes in ischemic. For thrombotic, this is two-thirds, and embolic is one-third. Embolic is commonly from the heart, aortic arch, or large cerebral arteries. Sources include AFib, valvular disease, or PFO, patent for foramen oval, which is a paradoxical venous emboli, part of embolic. Risk factors for ischemic strokes. Hypertension is the most significant and modifiable risk factor. Very important. Dyslipidemia, diabetes, AFib, and cigarette smoking. Some non-modifiable risk factors are being male, increased age, ethnicity, and family history. Anterior circulation symptoms like the ACA or middle cerebral. There'll be contralateral arm or leg weakness and contralateral sensory deficits. Visual changes, contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, loss of visual fields on the opposite side of the stroke. For posterior circulation symptoms, we have the Vs, vomiting, visual changes, vertigo. Also, nystagmus, nausea, coma, drop attacks, or ataxia, 
for diagnosis, first thing is CT head without contrast. This is the best initial test to rule out a hemorrhagic stroke first. CT may be normal in the first 6 to 24 hours, however. MRI is the most accurate to diagnose a stroke. Some ancillary testing is neurovascular imaging like CT or MR angiography. You can also do a carotid Doppler ultrasound, EKG, echo, and cardiac monitoring. Conventional angiography is rarely done. Immediate management for ischemic strokes within three hours of symptom onset. You want to do alteplase, which is a thrombolytic, if no contraindications. So some contraindications include a BP over 185, over 110, or greater. Recent bleeding, bleeding disorder, and recent trauma. Thrombolytics can be used within 4.5 hours in some patients under 80 years old or under 25 on the NIH stroke scale, so it's not maximally severe, and they're not a diabetic with a previous stroke. Mechanical thrombectomy can be performed within 24 hours of symptom onset of large artery occlusion in the anterior circulation compared to alteplase alone. Thrombectomy is associated with improve, improved reperfusion, early neurologic recovery, and a functional outcome. Over 3 to 4.5 hours of symptom onset, aspirin, and long-term management. Blood pressure should only be lowered if the blood pressure is over 185, over 110, if thrombolytics are to be used, or over 220, over 120, if no plan to use thrombolytics. So remember the penumbra is the area that's semi-dead basically around the initial infarct that can still be salvageable. So that's why you want to keep the blood pressure up so it still perfuses that area. Long-term outpatient management of ischemic strokes, antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, clopidogrel, dipyridamol. Aspirin therapy should not be used or initiated until 24 hours after the time of thrombolytic therapy. If a patient was already on aspirin prior to stroke, either add dipyridamol or switch to clopidogrel. For statin therapy, statin should be initiated regardless of LDL level. A stroke equals a statin. To go to some of the locations and symptoms and other manifestations of areas that you might find the stroke, we'll start with the MCA, the middle cerebral artery. The, think MCA is most common artery and middle cerebral artery. This is the most common type of ischemic stroke. For clinical manifestations, it has contralateral sensory and motor deficits greater in the arm and face, greater than the leg, and greater than the foot. So think about the homunculus and its distribution across a um, section of the brain. For facial involvement, only involves the lower half of the face. Patients will be able to raise the eyebrow as they're unable to in Bell's palsy. Visual contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, which is loss of the visual fields on the opposite side of the stroke. This leads to a gaze preference towards the side of the lesion, lesion initially. Dominant left in 90% hemisphere. So dominant left in 90% hemisphere. Aphasia. Roca's area is expressive. Broken speech. That's how I remember it. Where Nicky's is sensory. Um, and this is comprehension. So where Nicky's is a longer word. Comprehension is a longer word. So Wernicke's is comprehensive aphasia, whereas Broca's is expressive aphasia with its broken speech. Non-dominant, usually right hemisphere, spatial defects, um, dysarthria, neglect of the other side, importantly. A nosognosia, <laughs> inability to perceive their illness, lack of awareness. Flat affect, impaired judgment, and impulsivity. Moving to ACA, anterior cerebral artery strokes. Clinical manifestations of ACA strokes are contralateral sensory and motor deficits greater in the leg and foot. Remember, remembering the homunculus and where the distribution is in the brain. The face is usually spared. Uh, urinary incontinence is common with ACAs. Voluntary urethral stricture, uh, sphincter rather, by choice by the frontal lobe. And also middle and lower lobe body seen with the homunculus. So think about urinary incontinence with the ACA in that voluntary area in the frontal lobe. So think about the voluntary urethral sphincter. Also for ACA there'll be contralateral homonymous hemianopsia which leads to the gaze preference towards the side of the lesion initially again 
personality and cognitive defects, especially with that frontal lobe involvement, confusion, flat affect, and impaired judgment. Next, for PCA, posterior cerebral artery syndrome or stroke, think of the Vs again, vertebral, vertigo, including nystagmus, vomiting, and visual changes like diplopia. PCA, posterior cerebral artery, homonymous hemianopsia may spare the macula. Alexia without agraphia, if dominant hemisphere is left in the PCA. Visual hallucinations, sensory loss, coma, limb ataxia, nystagmus, cerebellar signs, nausea, vomiting, and drop attacks. Also under the section of PCA, no vertebrobasilar artery. These show the classic crossed symptoms, which are ipsilateral cranial nerve deficits with contralateral motor or sensory deficits. Diplopia, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, limb, cere cerebellar dysfunction. Asymmetric but bilateral deficits are the rule in basal or infarcts. For example, hemiparesis with motor or reflex abnormalities on the non hemiparetic side. Crossed symptoms for vertebrobasilar artery again. So going over the four types of intracranial hemorrhage, epidural hematoma, the location is arterial bleed being most common between the skull and dura, mechanism is most common after temporal bone fracture, MMA, middle meningeal artery, remembering that in MMA they may get hit in the side of the head, breaks the bone, and ruptures the middle meningeal artery. Clinical manifestations, it varies, brief loss of consciousness, then a lucid interval, then a coma, headache, nausea, vomiting, etc., CSF fluid um, from rhinorrhea, cranial nerve 3 palsy if tentorial herniation. In diagnosis, on CT, you'll see a convex or lens-shaped bleed for epidural that does not cross the suture lines, and it's usually in the temporal area. So for management, if it's herniated, if not, evacuate early, observation if small. If it's increased intracranial pressure, you can do mannitol, hyperventilation, head elevation, and shunt. For subdural hematoma or hemorrhage, the location is a venous bleed, which is most common. These are the bridging veins between the dura and arachnoid due to tearing of the cortical bridging veins. This is most common in the elderly and alcoholics due to the brain atrophy. The mechanism is a most commonly a blunt trauma often causes bleeding on the other side of the injury, which is called a contra coup. This is a venous bleed. Clinical manifestations vary, may have focal neurosymptoms. For diagnosis on CT, it'll be a concave pattern, which is a crescent-shaped bleed, and it does cross the suture lines in subdural. Management is hematoma evacuation versus supportive management. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhage Location is an arterial bleed between the arachnoid and the pia mater. The mechanism most commonly is a berry aneurysm rupture, or AVM, arterial venous malformation. Clinical manifestations is classically the thunderclap, sudden headache, which is the worst headache of my life, unilateral, occipital area, plus or minus loss of conscious, nausea, vomiting, meningeal symptoms, stiff neck, photophobia, and delirium. No focal neurodeficits usually. It could also be Tursen syndrome, which is retinal hemorrhages. For a diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage, CT scan is usually performed first. If the CT is negative, you can do a lumbar puncture, in which you'll find xanthrochromia, which are red blood cells, and also an increased CSF pressure. Four vessel arteriography after confirming SAH. Management is supportive, bed rest, stool softeners, lower ICP. Lower BP gradually with nicardipine, nimodipine, and labetalol. Intracranial hemorrhage, ICH. The location is intraparenchymal. Mechanism is hypertension, AV malformation. Could also be trauma or amyloid deposits. Manifestations are headache, nausea, vomiting. Diagnosis, CT. Intraparenchymal bleed. Do not perform an LP if suspected because it may cause brain herniation. Very important. So you only do, if the CT is negative and you're suspecting subarachnoid, then you do the LP, but not if it's intracerebral. 
management IV mannitol or supportive with gradual BP reduction. So now we'll go into those again, but in more detail. So again, epidural hematoma. So the MMA gives you a temporal fracture. So middle meningeal artery gives you a fracture in the temporal bone. The pathophys, again, most commonly due to a rupture of the MMA, middle meningeal artery, often associated with a temporal bone fracture, may lead to hemorrhagic stroke and brain herniation. Clinical manifestations, three classic phases, a brief loss of consciousness followed by a lucid interval. Patient regains consciousness and seems fine. Followed by a neurologic deterioration, mental status changes to coma as a result of increased intracranial pressure. During the deterioration phase, headache, vomiting, aphasia, hemiparesis, and seizure may occur. Uncle herniation, which is a cranial nerve 3 palsy, is a fixed dilated blown pupil can be seen on the ipsilateral side of the injury, which is due to tentorial herniation compressing cranial nerve 3. Also again the classic Cushing's reflex, hypertension, bradycardia, and respiratory irregularity. For diagnosis of epidural hematoma, a head CT without contrast is the best initial test of choice. You see the biconvex, lens-shaped, hyperdensity, usually in the temporal area, that does not cross suture lines. For management, hematoma evacuation or craniotomy is the management of choice. Prevent irreversible brain injury and death. May be observed closely with serial imaging if small and the patient is in good condition. Increased intracranial pressure, you want to do head elevation, short-term hyperventilation, and hyperosmolar therapy with IV mannitol or hypertonic saline. Moving to subdural hematoma, this is bleeding between the dura and the arachnoid membranes. For etiology, it is most commonly due to a rupture of the cortical bridging veins after blunt trauma. Risk factors are elderly and alcoholics. Again, the brain atrophy puts tension on the bridging veins, those with dementia as well. Anticoagulant use and shaken baby syndrome or child abuse suspect a subdural hematoma. Manifestations. Because the bleeding is venous, it can develop over a long period of time compared to epidural hematoma, so they can be chronic subdural hematomas. Varies, but usually a gradual increase in generalized neurologic symptoms, such as headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, or focal neurosymptoms. May have loss of consciousness. For diagnosis of subdural, head CT without contrast, you see the concave, crescent-shaped bleed that can cross suture lines. If it's severe, a midline shift may occur due to the increased intracranial pressure. A CT scan may be negative immediately after the injury, so serial imaging should be done. For management, non-operatively, if they're stable with a small hematoma or no CT signs of brain herniation, such as a midline shift under five millimeters, or no signs of increased intracranial pressure. Surgical management is evacuation, which is indicated if over five millimeters or a greater midline shift or severe. Options include a burr hole trephination, craniotomy, or decompressive craniectomy. Next, going again into the subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is bleeding between the arachnoid membranes and the pia mater. Etiology is most commonly due to a ruptured barry aneurysm in the anterior communicating artery. So that's the most common area, the anterior communicating artery in the circle of Willis maybe due to an AV malformation, stroke, or trauma. Risk factors, cigarette smoking and hypertension are most common. PC, polycystic kidney disease, rather. Atherosclerotic disease, smoking, excessive alcohol intake. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, and family history. Clinical manifestations are the classic sudden intense thunderclap headache that is often unilateral in the occipital area is often described as the worst headache of my life. It may be associated with delirium, seizures, nausea, vomiting, and meningeal signs, very important meningeal signs, photophobia, neck stiffness, and fever, and loss of consciousness initially as well. Physical exam may reveal meningeal signs again. That's the classic nuchal rigidity, positive Brzezinski's or Kiernig sign, usually not associated with focal neuro deficits but may again have that cranial nerve 3 palsy, the fixed, dilated, blown pupil 
due to the rupture of the tentorial area, and also Tursen syndrome, Tursen syndrome, which is retinal hemorrhages and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Diagnosis, CT, CT scan, no contrast. Initial study of choice will show subarachnoid bleeding. LP, again, the LP is done if the CT is negative and no papilledema or focal signs. And on that LP, you'll see xanthrochromia. These are yellow to pink color of the CSF fluid due to breakdown of the RBCs in the CSF, increasing CSF protein from bilirubin, and increasing CSF pressure. Four-vessel angiography is usually performed after confirming subarachnoid hemorrhage to identify the source of bleeding and other aneurysms there as well. Management is supportive with bed rest, stool softeners due to the iron from the hemolysis, lower intracranial pressure, nemotipine reduces cerebral vasospasms, improving neurologic outcomes in subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is similar to nifedipine, but this is for specifically cerebral vessels and specifically for preventing vasospasms. So that's nemotipine for subarachnoid hemorrhage, vasospasm prevention. Lowering the BP may decrease the risk for rebleeding, but it also may increase the risk of infarction. If needed, labetalol, nicardipine, and allopril are preferred antihypertensives. Ventriculostomy may be needed if subarachnoid hemorrhage is associated with hydrocephalus. Prevention of rebleeding, endovascular coiling or surgical clipping of the aneurysm, or AV malformation used to prevent rebleeding. Coiling is preferred over clipping. So very important in the prevention strategies for subarachnoid is endovascular coiling or surgical clipping of the aneurysm or AVM used to prevent rebleeding. And again, coiling over clipping. Intracerebral hemorrhage, bleeding within the brain parenchyma itself, may compress the brain, ventricles, and sulci. Risk factors, hypertension, the most common overall cause for spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage. And cerebral amyloid angiography is the most common cause of non-traumatic ICH in the elderly. So this is basically dementia putting them at increased risk. AV malformations, again, is the most common cause in childhood, in trauma, old age, high alcohol intake, and coagulopathy. So again, hypertension, most common overall for spontaneous. Cerebral amy amyloid angiography, most common in the elderly due to dementia and AVMs in children. Clinical manifestations, neurosymptoms usually increase with minutes to hours. Headache, nausea, vomiting, syncope, focal neuro symptoms like hemiplegia, hemiparesis, seizures, AMS, lethargy, and uptendation. So remember, there's usually no focal neuro symptoms in subarachnoid hemorrhage and more meningeal signs in, sub in subarachnoid hemorrhage may have focal, motor, or sensory deficits. This is intracranial hemorrhage. Diagnosis, CT, no contrast. Management, supportive. Gradual blood pressure reduction. Prevention of increased intracranial pressure, raising the head of the bed 30 degrees. Limiting IV fluids, blood pressure management, analgesia and sedation. Reduction of increased intracranial pressure if persistent. IV mannitol, temporary hyperventilation as well. Blood pressure reduction, you wanted to use IV labetalol, nicardipine, esmolol, hydralazine, nitroprusside, and nitroglycerin are all useful agents. Aggressive reduction only if the systolic BP is over 200 or the MAP is over 150. So the MAP is just two-thirds diastolic and one-third systolic. Next, basilar skull fracture. Most commonly occurs after traumatic head injuries. Most involve the temporal bone. Clinical manifestations, it varies. Many have no symptoms. Headache, AMS, focal cranial nerve deficits, or focal neurologic deficits. For physical examination, very classic signs here for the basal or skull fracture are periorbital ecchymosis, which are the raccoon eyes, mastoid ecchymosis, which is battle sign, hemotympanum, which is blood behind the tympanic membrane, and rhinorrhea, which is a CSF leak. Head CT with no contrast in addition to the fracture, pneumocephalus may be seen. Pneumocephalus. Management, non-operative in most cases without underlying brain injury. Surgical management may be indicated if there is a mass effect of the brain parenchyma or a CSF leak. Depressed skull fractures are often considered open fractures and are admitted to neurosurgery.
and tetanus is needed. Next will be the burst Jefferson fracture of the atlas, which is C1. This is a bilateral fracture of both the anterior and posterior arches of the atlas. Stability is determined by the involvement of the transverse ligament. The transverse ligament disruption equals unstable. It may be associated with a C1 and C2 dislocation. The mechanism is axial load on the back of the head or hyperextension of the neck, such as caused by a diving accident. Clinical manifestations are upper neck pain, decreased range of motion, usually without neurologic symptoms. Physical exam, neurologic um, exam is usually intact. Diagnosis, on lateral radiographs, you'll see increase in the predental space between C1 and the odontoid, the dens, atlantodens interval over 3 millimeters in adults and over 5 millimeters in children. The open mouth odontoid view may show a step off of the lateral mass of the atlas, where the transverse diameter of the atlas is 7 millimeters greater than that of the axis, suspect transverse ligament rupture. Management for non-operative management, you want to do external immobilization with a hard cervical orthosis versus a halo for 6 to 12 weeks for stable fractures if this is an intact transverse ligament. For operative, posterior C1 and C2 fusion versus occipital cervical fusion if unstable. Odontoid fractures. This is a fracture of the dens, the odontoid process of the, of the axis C2. The mechanism is a head placed in forced flexion or extension in the anterior posterior orientation, such as a forward fall onto the forehead. Type 1 is an oblique fracture at the tip of the odontoid. Type 2 is a fracture at the base of the odontoid, the dens, where it attaches to C2. This is the most common type, and type 2 is also unstable. It has a high association with non-union. An os odontoidium appears like a type 2 fracture on radiographs. Type 3 extends into C2. Clinical manifestations, again, neck pain worse with motion, may have dysphagia if a large retropharyngeal hematoma is present, usually no neuro defects. Diagnosis, it's best seen on AP odontoid view, the open mouth view, the CT is the best scan to delineate fracture pattern. You can do an MRI of symptoms of spinal cord injury as well. For management, os odontoidium, aplasia or hypoplasia of the odontoid, you want to do observation. Posterior C1 or C2 fusion if symptoms of myelopathy. For a type 1 fracture, cervical orthosis is fine. For a type 2, if it's in young patients, halo immobilization, surgery if risk factors for non-union. If it's if, um, type 2 fracture in the elderly, however, surgery is preferred. Type 3, cervical orthosis. Next will be the hangman's C2 or axis pedicle fracture. Traumatic bilateral fractures, spondylo spondylolysis of the pedicles or pars interarticularis of the axis vertebra, C2, may lead to spondylolisthesis between C2 and C3, anterior dislocation of C2. This is an unstable fracture, 30% are associated with cervical spinal fractures, but usually no cord injury. The mechanism for a hangman's is extreme hyperextension injuries of the skull, atlas, and axis, especially in an already extended neck, most commonly seen in MVAs. Clinical manifestations, neck pain, normal neuro exam. Diagnosis by radiographs, you'll see subluxation of C2 on C3. CT or MRI also works. Management non-operatively, a type 1, under 3 millimeters of horizontal displacement. You want to do a rigid cervical collar for 4 to 6 weeks. If it's a type 2, which is 3 to 5 millimeters of displacement, you can do closed reduction followed by a halo immobilization for 8 to 12 weeks. And if it's operative for type 2, which is again over 5 millimeters of displacement with severe angulation, you could do operation. So again, hangman fracture, note the slipping of C2 forward compared to C3. Next, atlas fracture and transverse ligamental instability. The mechanism is hyperextension and compression injuries. Low risk of neurologic complications may be associated with an axis fracture. Atlanto-occipital dislocation, extreme flexion involving 
the atlas C1 and the axis C2 associated with odontoid fractures. Atlantoaxial joint instability. Instability between the atlas C1 and axis C2. The mechanism, it could be traumatic or non-traumatic for atlantoaxial joint instability. Traumatic would be due to extreme flexion rotation injuries. Non-traumatic could be degenerative as well as Down syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, remembering the cervical RA, and os odontoidium. For clinical manifestations, you'll have neck pain. Neuro exam is usually normal. Myelopathic symptoms, however, muscle weakness, hyperreflexia, wide gait, and bladder dysfunction. Diagnosis, open mouth odontoid view, may see increased atlantodens interval, ADI. An ADI over 3.5 millimeters is considered unstable. An ADI over 10 millimeters indicates surgery in RA. You can also do CT or MRI. Management depends on the cause. An os odontoidium with symptoms of myelopathy and a widened angle may need a posterior C1-C2 fusion. Next will be clay shoveler's fracture. This is a spinous process avulsion fracture, most commonly at the lower cervical, C7 most common, or upper thoracic vertebrae, C6 to T3. The mechanism is forced neck flexion with the muscles pulling off a piece of the spinous process, especially after a sudden deceleration injury, like an MVA. It's usually a stable injury, however. Manifestations are neck pain or pain between the shoulder blades. Physical exam may have localized tenderness or crepitus with range of motion of the neck, usually no neuro defects. For diagnosis, cervical radiographs, lateral view is the best view, oblique fracture line with fragment displaced posterior inferiorly. On AP view, double spinous process shadow suggesting of displacement. CT scan is preferred over radiographs. Management, non-operatively is first line. NSAIDs, rest, and mobilization in a hard collar for comfort. Surgical excision only needed if non-union or persistent pain. Next, continuing with fractures, the flexion teardrop fracture. This is anterior displacement of a wedge-shaped fragment fracture, the so-called teardrop shape of the anterior inferior portion of the superior vertebrae, often associated with a vertebral height change. Most commonly occurs in the lower cervical spine, often associated with a loss of vertebral height again. Mechanism of flexion or teardrop fractures, obviously severe flexion and compression causes the vertebral body to collide with the inferior vertebral body. They're highly unstable because of the disruption of the posterior longitudinal ligament, and they may cause anterior cervical cord syndrome, importantly. Anterior cervical cord syndrome is also in clinical manifestations neck pain, anterior cervical cord syndrome, and the management is surgical decompression due to its highly unstable nature. And then there's also extension teardrop fractures. Triangular shaped avulsion fracture of the anterior inferior corner of the vertebral body as a result of rupture of the anterior longitudinal ligament. It's most common at C2, and it may be seen at C5 to C7. No loss of vertebral height. Extension teardrop fractures are unstable in extension and stable in flexion, however. The mechanism is abrupt neck extension, and the teardrop appears similar to the flexion teardrop fracture. Both can be represented by an anterior inferior vertebral fragment. However, the extension teardrop is not as severe of an injury, as the vertebral body is not displaced, and it can cause central cord syndrome, but it's not a common occurrence. So, extension teardrop fracture causes central cord syndrome, where flexion teardrop fracture causes anterior cord syndrome. So just think it flexes towards the anterior, so anterior cord, and extension, you might think posterior cord, but it's central cord syndrome for extension. Next will be burst fractures. Burst fractures due to the nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc being forced into the vertebral body, causing it to shatter or burst outward usually as a result of vertebral compression injury. The mechanism is axial loading that causes vertebral compression injuries of the cervical and lumbar spine. It could be stable or unstable. If it's stable burst fracture, all the ligaments are intact and usually no posterior displacement of the fragment segment. If it's unstable, over 50% compression of the spinal cord, over 50% loss of vertebral height, 
and over 20 degrees of spinal angulation or associated with neuro defects may cause incomplete or complete spinal cord injury, such as anterior cord syndrome. Diagnosis, radiographs, comminuted ver vertebral body loss of the vertebral height, depicted as a vertical fracture on the AP view. Management for unstable needs surgical correction. So next for subclavian steel syndrome. Subclavian steel syndrome refers to the signs and or symptoms that occur during a reserved retrograde blood flow from the vertebral artery due to the ipsilateral arm as a result of decreased flow through the subclavian artery, stenosis or occlusion. The blood flow to the arm as it is the, at the expense of the vertebral basilar circulation. So basically there's a blockage in the subclavian proximal to the vertebral artery and the blood instead of going normally there's a blockage it needs to form collaterals to go around so it just takes the blood from the vertebral artery going backwards in order to supply the arm so that's why it steals for the subclavian so etiologies atherosclerosis of the subclavian artery is most common takayasu arteritis dissecting aortic aneurysm and thoracic outlet syndrome as well so knowing how to differentiate thoracic outlet syndrome and subclavian steel syndrome Manifestations, mostly asymptomatic. Symptoms of the arm, arterial insufficiency. They may have arm claudication with exercise and paresthesias. Symptoms of vertebrobasilar insufficiency. Presyncope or syncope, dizziness, neurodeficits, vertigo, diplopia, nystagmus, weakness, drop attacks, gait abnormalities. So they can either have symptoms of claudication of the arm or basically of the head. So if you're forcing a lot of blood from the vertebral artery to the arm then you're going to have less for the head or if you're forcing a lot of or if you're needing the blood for the head and you're not getting enough to the arm you'll have the arm claudication so on physical exam blood pressure differences between the arms reduction of blood pressure in the affected arm over 15 millimeters of mercury compared to the unaffected arm radial pulse may diminish with arm elevation or arm exercise so you want to consider the adsens test here for thoracic outlet syndrome as well to differentiate, or something like coarctation of the aorta or peripheral arterial disease. Diagnosis, continue wave Doppler, which will show a flow, duplex ultrasound, or transcranial Doppler. Management is revascularization or percutaneous transluminal angioplasty in severe cases. So next we'll go to the different cord syndromes to finish up. Anterior cord syndrome, we'll go through the mechanism, deficits, and preservation of these injuries. So anterior cord syndrome is most common after a blowout vertebral body burst fracture inflection, anterior spinal artery injury or occlusion, direct anterior cord compression could also be due to aortic dissection, SLE and AIDS. The deficits of anterior cord will have motor deficits, lower extremity greater than upper extremity as it's the corticospinal tract that's involved. Anterior cord is the motor tracts, remember. Sensory deficits, pain, temperature and from the spinal thalamic tract, which are more lateral, um, descending down the cord, may develop bladder dysfunction, retention and incontinence, remember, for motor. So deficits of anterior cord, motor deficits, lower extremity, and also pain and temperature. For the preservation, what's preserved in anterior cord syndrome, proprioception, vibration, pressure, and the DCML, the dorsal column medial lemniscus is spared on the way up. So that posterior aspect is spared, so you're still going to have that proprioception, vibration, and pressure sense, um, as well as light touch is preserved. For a central cord syndrome, this is hyperextension injuries. So 50% occur in an MVA, also falls in the elderly, gunshot wounds, tumors, central cord spinal stenosis, and syringomyelia, which is cystic enlargement of the spinal cord. Most common incomplete cord syndrome. It affects primarily the central gray matter, including the spinal thalamic tracts. So for central cord, they'll have motor and sensory deficits. For motor, however, it'll be the upper extremity, which is greater than the lower. The distal portion of the upper extremity is more severe in involvement, the hands, from the corticospinal involvement. Sensory deficits, Again, will be pain and temperature due to the spinal thalamic tract, and deficits greater in the upper extremity than the lower, sometimes described as the shawl distribution. So remember, central cord, they're going to have more upper extremity, 
problems with motor and sensory, whereas anterior cord will be more lower extremity problems. And again, preserved in central cord syndrome is also that dorsal column medial lemniscus with proprioception, vibration, and pressure sensation, and light touch. So the two things are both preserved in anterior and central cord. It's just the differing areas in which the motor and sensory are affected. Posterior cord is next. This is rare, damage to the posterior cord and posterior spinal stenosis, loss of proprioception and vibration sense only. So that's only that DCML cord that's being affected. Preserved is pain and light touch and no motor deficits. And lastly, brown saccard syndrome. This is a unilateral hemisection of the spinal cord, most common after a penetrating trauma. Tumors may cause it as well. It's a very rare injury. And you have ipsilateral deficits motor as well as vibra vibration and proprioception. So motor is due to that lateral corticospinal tract and vibration and proprioception is due to the dorsal column. You also have in brown saccard uniquely contralateral deficits, pain and temperature due to the lateral spinal thalamic tract, usually two levels below the injury where the spinal thalamic tract crosses at the spinal cord level. That's brown saccard syndrome. Because the spinal thalamic tract crosses right away, so the patient will be contralateral loss. And that will conclude our neurologic symptom for pants prep pearls.